The Reckoning by Braley Parkinson 1. Before Ashlyn Breyer fell hard to the ground, her body slamming against the hardwood floor with a thud. The sound of breaking glass echoed in her ears as she struggled to make sense of what was happening. Her heart raced as she tried to break free from the weight on top of her. Jolted out of a peaceful slumber, Ashlyn grappled with the intense hold restraining her movements. A pointed object pressed menacingly against her neck. She let out a frightened whimper as she desperately searched for something to say. Don't make a sound, Marcus growled in her ear his breath reeking of marijuana. Ashlyn froze. Her heart was racing. She knew he wouldn't hesitate to kill her, but surely not in her parents' house, right? Now that he'd broken into the house, Ashlyn wasn't sure how far Marcus would take things. Why did you file that personal protection order against me? He gritted his teeth angrily. I am sorry, Ashlyn cried out, her heart racing with fear. I'm not going back to prison, unless it's for something big. You hear me? It's gotta be big. He replaced the knife with his forearm, squeezing hard against her windpipe, cutting off her oxygen. Please, Marcus. Please. Struggling for breath, Ashlyn felt his grip tighten around her neck, causing her head to pound. She feared losing consciousness, but just as her vision began to blur, Marcus forcefully pulled her from the ground. Get the keys. We're leaving. Marcus said. Ashlyn's breathing was labored as she coughed and tried to catch her breath. The throbbing at the base of her skull distorted her vision, making everything appear blurry. As she struggled to control of herself, Marcus struck her with a forceful blow to her side, causing her to stumble backwards. How do I get out of this? Ashlyn wondered. Her mind was blank from fear. Marcus pulled her up from the ground and pushed her against the bedroom wall. Where are the keys? He sneered. In the kitchen. He grabbed her arm and dragged her into the kitchen, pushing her against the island in the center of the room. Ashlyn quickly reached for her keys as Marcus gripped the back of her nightshirt with both hands. Now get to the garage. We're going to drive to my sister's house. Keep your eyes on the road and don't try anything. Take the freeway and go straight to Brianna's. You got that? She nodded. With a firm grip on Ashlyn's arm, Marcus forced her into the garage. He brandished the knife against her neck as she reached for the car door handle. Ashlyn glanced at the visor where the garage door opener hung in her vehicle. If she moved fast enough, she might be able to open the garage before closing the car door. The sudden movement might startle Marcus, and she could break free and run into the street. Don't even think about it. The moment you run, I will come after you. It was as if he'd read her mind. Ashlyn shivered at the thought. Marcus climbed into the driver's seat, quickly scrambling over to the passenger seat while pulling her in beside him. Marcus snatched the garage door opener from the visor before starting the car. Drive to Brianna's house. No stopping. Brianna had never liked Ashlyn. She wasn't going to assist Ashlyn in convincing Marcus to let her go. With a sense of dread, she obeyed his commands, fully aware that he now had the power to end her life without hesitation. He had warned her before that vehicles were the perfect setting for murder. If you ever cross me, just remember that I know the perfect way to get rid of you. You got wheels, a trunk and a small crime scene to destroy. Park the car on the east side of Detroit, in an abandoned neighborhood, Set the car on fire and you will never get caught. You could be a test case if you mess up. Don't forget that. Ashlyn clenched her jaw and gripped the steering wheel tightly, her eyes darting between the road and the rearview mirror. He leaned into her, his breath hot and rank against her ear. You'd better do as I say, Ashlyn, Marcus growled, his fingers tightening around her throat. I won't hesitate to make you wish you'd never crossed me. You understand? She nodded, her eyes brimming with tears. This was not how things were supposed to go. She had been trying to escape from Marcus for months, but he refused to let her leave. His violent actions intensified when she expressed a desire to take a break from their relationship. The stress of it all became too much, leading her to take a semester off from college in order to end things once and for all. However, Marcus became angry when she tried to break up with him. You don't need to do this. Please just let me go. I will tell the court, I no longer need a protection order. Too late. 
How had she let herself get caught in a situation like this? Ashlyn wondered. As they approached the outskirts of Detroit, Marcus finally removed the knife from her throat. Park the car here, he instructed, pointing at a deserted intersection. I'll take it from here. Ashlyn's heart raced, thumping loudly in her ears as they pulled in front of a vacant lot of overgrown grass. Looking around, Ashlyn knew getting away from Marcus in this area would be futile. Rushing through the empty streets might be just as dangerous as staying with Marcus. The neighborhood was full of the gnarled ruins of burned-out houses and skeletons of single-family homes that had decayed because of abandonment. You know it would be a waste to leave, don't you? Marcus said. Good. This hood is just like our relationship. I have total control. You are mine until I say you can leave. Got it? Ashlyn started straight ahead, refusing to answer. Predictably, people interpreted the gesture as aggression, leading Marcus to punch her in the back of the head. She cringed as he forcefully pulled her into the passenger seat, before getting out of the car and swiftly moving to the driver's side. After climbing inside, he sped off towards his sister's house. Ten minutes later, they pulled into the driveway of his sister's house. You know no one around here is going to help you, so don't try anything. The more you resist, the more pain you will experience. Marcus got out of the car, opened the passenger door, and pulled her onto the pavement. He pulled her to the side door of the house and pushed it open. What is she doing here? Marcus's sister Brianna yelled when he burst through the back door of her house. You owe me. He retorted at Brianna. I don't want anything to do with her. Take her somewhere else. She's going to be in the basement for a few days. I'll move here as soon as I find a good place. The basement? What did he have planned for her? Ashlyn wondered. Her mind raced as Marcus and Brianna argued for the next few seconds, but her thoughts stopped when Marcus drug her to the basement door. He kicked the door open and tried to shove her down the stairs. She held onto the door frame to avoid being pushed into the basement. I don't want this trouble here. Brianna screamed. Her daughter Sierra wailed in the background. Like I said, you owe me. I need to keep her here for a couple of hours at least, Marcus replied. Mama. Sierra cried, rushing into the kitchen with tears running down her cheeks. Get out of here, Brianna hissed at Sierra. The young girl ran into the living room. Recognizing Sierra's adverse reaction, Ashlyn let Marcus escort her downstairs. She didn't want to contribute to Sierra's trauma. A wave of dread washed over Ashlyn as they descended into the dimly lit basement. A damp mildew lace smell filled her nostrils, and all she could see was the outline of a bed and clothing strewn about. Was that blood on the soiled mattress? Ashlyn wasn't sure, but an ominous feeling sunk in as she reached the bottom of the steps. This could be the end for her. Marcus shoved her ahead, causing her to stumble. Before she could regain her composure, a set of handcuffs snapped onto her wrist. Don't try anything, he growled. Ashlyn shivered at the sound of hatred in his voice. She wanted to fight back but she knew it would only make things worse. Ashlyn had to buy time and find a way out. What do you want from me, Marcus? she asked. He dragged her over to a pole in the basement and wrapped a rope around her body, binding her in place. Obedience, he said, yanking the rope tight. Please. Help me, Brianna. Help me. Ashlyn screamed. Marcus slapped her heart across the face. Shut up. Ain't nobody coming to save you. She was at a loss for what to do next. Her body was tightly bound, and she wasn't confident in her ability to untie the thick rope that encircled her body without assistance. Marcus, please. If you let me go, I won't say a thing. I'll get rid of the personal protection order, and they won't come back to serve the papers. Nah. You should have never sent the sheriff to my mom's house. You gonna pay now. I'm going to make sure you never have the chance to do anything like that again. After Marcus gave her one final slap, he removed the handcuffs and stormed up the stairs, leaving Ashlyn alone to ponder her escape plan. She knew his sister wouldn't be of any help, and she doubted anyone passing by on the sidewalk would hear her screams in time. Upstairs, Marcus and Brianna argued about what should be done with Ashlyn. She tried to block them out but their words were frightening. Are you getting rid of her? Brianna asked. Gonna have to eventually. 
but I'll keep her for a while. Not here. She snapped. Just let me find a place all right. Remember, I helped you with Caesar. Ashlyn's heart raced. Caesar had been the father of Brianna's children. He'd been a victim of a drive-by shooting. No one ever arrested Marcus and his gang, but it was common knowledge that they had murdered Caesar. Ashlyn stopped listening. She had to save her sanity and figure a way out. In the basement, the temperature dropped drastically and she could barely see anything. Observing the cement walls, she concluded that her best escape route would be to free herself and climb out through the basement window. She only noticed a lone squat window next to the pole she was tied to. That was the only chance for escape, but first she had to get free. Ashlyn wiggled her hands. The rope cut into her skin, rubbing her hands raw. She felt a wave of agony as the restraint bit into her flesh. Ashlyn gritted her teeth and struggled in earnest, jerking her body back and forth, twisting and contorting her limbs to break free. Pain exploded in her wrists and ankles, but she refused to give up. The rope was loosening when she heard the basement door creak open. Ashlyn stopped trying to get loose and remained as still as she could. Initially, Ashlyn thought she was alone until she heard a faint creak coming from the staircase. She looked up and saw Sierra quietly approaching. Sierra, you shouldn't be down here, Ashlyn said, her voice distressed. She hated the child seeing her this way. Sweetie, go back upstairs. I don't want you, Ashlyn's eyes widened in fear as she noticed the knife in Sierra's hand. She instinctively flinched away from it. What are you doing? Ashlyn asked. The little girl held her index finger to her lips, showing she wanted Ashlyn to be quiet. That was when she realized Sierra had come to save her. It took a few minutes of Sierra's small hands working the knife back and forth, but eventually it sliced through the rope. Ashlyn grabbed Sierra in her arms and hugged her tight, spilling tears over the top of her head. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ashlyn whispered. She let Sierra go and looked at the basement window. She could get through it, but it would be a tight squeeze. As she was calculating how she was going to make it through the window, Sierra took Ashlyn's hand and lifted her finger to her lips again. She pulled her towards the stairs. I can't go out that way, Ashlyn said in a quiet voice. They're out front. You can go out the back and run through the alley, Sierra whispered back. Ashlyn understood the urgency of the situation. They needed to act quickly. She followed Sierra's lead as they hurried up the stairs, careful not to make any noise. Once they reached the kitchen, Sierra urgently guided her towards the back door. With both hands she unlatched and opened the door. Without hesitation, Ashlyn bolted into the backyard, scaled the fence and sprinted down the alley as fast as her legs could carry her. 2. Jesus, I trust in you. Ashlyn Breyer replayed that line in her head, as she sat in the last pew of St. Michael Catholic Church, fully engaged in the sacred silence that accompanied Eucharistic adoration. She'd recently added a second day of adoration to her schedule. A few other adorers were scattered around the sanctuary, all of them respecting the beauty of holy silence. The oak beneath her was firm and unyielding, causing her knees to ache. With her eyes closed, she drifted into the tranquility of the space, her hands clasped tightly together as if to physically hold on to the prayer she said in her mind. The soft glow of candlelight bathed the sanctuary in a warm golden hue, casting long dancing shadows upon the stone walls and the vaulted ceilings above. Each flame seemed to compete in its own quiet battle against the encroaching darkness, a symbol of hope that Ashland clung to fiercely when night fell upon Detroit's troubled streets. St. Michael's was her refuge, not only from the spiritual skirmishes she faced, but also from the turmoil that gnawed at her soul. Here amidst the scent of incense that filled the air, frankincense laced with myrrh, she found her center. The aroma was ancient and comforting a fragrant whisper of tradition that transported her far from the urban tragedy waiting beyond the church doors. The incense rose in gentle swirls toward the heavens, carrying the silent prayers of the faithful along with it. Ashlyn's senses heightened, and she imagined her own pleas ascending with the smoke, reaching out for divine intervention in the celestial realm that she believed so fervently intersected with her own. Ashlyn's forehead creased, the serene visage momentarily disrupted by the storm of concern that raged silently within her. In the sacred stillness of St. Michael's, she grappled with the haunting image of Raymond, her brother, ensnared in a web of addiction and dabbling in occult practices 
that stood in stark contrast to everything she held dear. The juxtaposition of the church's peaceful embrace against the dark path her brother treaded seemed to widen an invisible chasm that fear alone could not bridge. Her heart ached as she envisioned him, lost in shadows she fought so tirelessly to dispel, and a quiet desperation laced her thoughts. How could she draw him back from the precipice when each attempt felt like grasping at smoke? Her hands, though steady in prayer, betrayed the inner turmoil she felt about her brother. But amidst this internal battle, Ashlyn's faith did not waver. It was the bedrock upon which she built her life and the wellspring from which she drew strength. She let her lips part, a silent litany forming beseeching guidance from the Almighty. Each word shaped in silence was an invocation, a plea for the wisdom to navigate the treacherous waters that threatened to consume her brother's soul. Lord, she implored without sound, grant me the clarity to be the beacon he needs, the fortitude to stand against the darkness that beckons him. Her whispers were unheard by human ears, but she trusted in the omnipresence of God, who listened even to the unspoken language of the heart. She imagined her prayers like threads, weaving through the very fabric of reality, stitching wounds unseen and bolstering her resolve. For Ashlyn, faith was not a mere concept. It was action, an indomitable force that propelled her forward in both her vocation as a teacher and her calling as a warrior against evil. She shouldered the weight of her task with grace, understanding that some battles were won on bended knee. In this hallowed space where the veil between earthly woes and divine providence seemed thinnest, Ashlyn Breyer found the courage to persevere, trusting that her steadfast devotion would illuminate the way. Ashlyn's eyes snapped open, a sudden intrusion of light banishing the darkness behind her lids. The church, still and serene, offered answers to the silent questions she held in her heart. Raymond had to forge his own path. He had to be the one to choose Jesus. All she could do was remind him of God's love for him. Thy will be done. A draft, cool and unexpected, danced through the hushed interior, toying with the flames of the candles arrayed before her. The flickering candlelight, a dance of shadows upon her face, mirrored the ebb and flow of her confidence. With each sway of the flame, doubt crept closer, casting long, undulating doubts over her features. A man at the front of the church cleared his throat and fidgeted. A woman across from her prayed quietly, her lips moving quickly and her eyes closed. She'd do what she could to help Raymond overcome his addiction, but that was not the worst of his troubles. What she worried about most was his descent into the occult. It had been weeks since he'd shown up at her job, withered and weak, withdrawing from a drug binge. He told her about his commitment to comedic religious practices. Was she really equipped to drag her brother back from the precipice on which he teetered? caught between addiction and the occult? Could her own hands, however clasped in prayer, pull him from the abyss into which he had so carelessly wandered? In the shifting patterns of light and shadow, Ashlyn saw an echo of her struggle, the constant flux between hope and despair, belief and incredulity. Her gaze once lifted heavenward, now dropped to the flickering wicks as if they held the secrets her prayers had not yet unlocked. Ashlyn's fingers pressed into the flesh of her palms, the edges of her nails leaving crescent imprints. Her knuckles whitened with the force of her grip, a silent testament to the fierce determination surging through her. She bowed her head lower, as if by sheer will she could penetrate the heavens and draw down the strength she so desperately needed. Words of prayer spun silently off her tongue, weaving a plea for guidance in the face of her brother's dire straits. Lord grant me the fortitude, she whispered against the hushed murmurs of adoration, to lead Raymond back to your light. The soft golden haze of candlelight that bathed the church in its otherworldly glow seemed to pulse in time with her heart, a slow steady rhythm promising unseen support. And in that moment of steadfast resolve, Ashlyn's mind tumbled backward, swept away by the current of memory. A sunlit park flashed before her inner eye, vibrant green leaves rustling in the wind's playful grasp. She saw herself younger, laughter bubbling from her lips as she chased after Raymond. His eyes bright with mischief and free from the shadows that now haunted them, glanced back at her over his shoulder. He dashed ahead, skittering past the oak trees, calling out for her to catch him if she could. Ray, she called out, giggling, her legs pumping as she raced across the grassy expanse. Wait up. He slowed, only to be tackled into a mess of giggles and sibling squabbles on the lawn. They lay there, side by side, catching their breath as clouds sailed lazily above. In those moments the world was reduced to the space they shared, their sanctuary from all else. Promise we'll always be there for each other? Raymond's voice, young and earnest, had asked, his hand extended pinky first toward her. 
Always, Ashlyn had bowed, locking her own pinky with his. A pact between hearts, unbreakable. The echo of that promise lingered even as the vision faded, drawing her back to the solemnity of the church. Ashlyn opened her eyes, feeling the weight of that long-ago oath anchoring her to this holy quest. Her spirit, buoyed by the love that had never waned, braced itself against the storm of her brother's afflictions. Through you all things are possible, she breathed, conviction steadying her voice. It was a truth she held to more fiercely than ever, it was the beacon that would guide Raymond home. Ashlyn's fingers clenched, nails digging into her palms as the unbidden memory of their childhood pledge faded. The warm and tender remnants of the past were a stark contrast to the cold reality that now gripped her heart. In the dim light of the church, where the flickering candles played with shadows and truths alike, Ashlyn's resolve crystallized like the rosary beads between her fingers. She knew what lay ahead would test her in ways she could not yet fathom. But there, in the presence of the sacrament, a silent oath took shape, binding her will to the promise she whispered into the hushed space of the chapel. Whatever it takes, Raymond, she vowed, her eyes narrowing with determination that cut through the incense-laden air. The weight of her brother's struggles bore down upon her, pressing its heavy yoke upon her shoulders. She felt it in every fiber, a gravity that bent her posture ever so slightly, a visible testament to the burden she carried for him. Yet in the slump of her frame there was no defeat, only the steadfastness of a sentinel standing watch against the encroaching darkness that sought to claim her brother. Help me carry this cross, she murmured, the plea woven through her exhalation as though she could breathe life into her resolve. Her fingertips brushed the wooden pew, tracing the grain as if to draw strength from another tree that had once borne a far greater weight. There, anchored in faith and fortified by love, Ashlyn Breyer stood on the precipice of a battle that was both deeply personal and infinitely vast. With the echoes of ancient prayers wrapping around her like armor, she prepared to step into the fray for the soul of her brother. Ashlyn's eyelids fell shut once more, veiling the determination that had previously sharpened her gaze. In the silence of her own darkness, the world's distractions faded to mere whispers against the fortress of her faith. Her lips quivered with the rhythm of silent prayers, each word a stepping stone laid across the tumultuous river of doubt, each syllable a beacon in search of divine guidance. Lord, show me the way, she implored within the sanctum of her mind, her voice unheard but no less potent. The prayer was an anchor, rooting her to the unshakable belief that grace would illuminate a path through the thicket of her brother's torment. A tranquility settled over her like a mantle as she communed with her God, the stillness punctuated only by the soft flicker of candlelight against her closed eyelids. In this momentary retreat from the world, Ashlyn found clarity amidst the cacophony of her fears. She envisioned herself not as the weary bearer of burdens, but as the steadfast guardian of her brother's soul, armed with the virtues of her faith, courage, compassion, and unwavering resolve. The chapel's air seemed to grow denser around her, charged with the weight of impending purpose. It was time. With a slow inhalation that filled her lungs with the sacred scent of incense and resolve, Ashlyn's eyes sprang open, mirroring the awakening of her spirit. She rose from the wooden pew, its familiar creak a benediction for the journey ahead. There, in the quiet sanctuary where prayers mingled with the breath of centuries, Ashlyn Breyer stood transformed. The shadows that had once danced upon her face now retreated before the light in her eyes, a renewed sense of purpose that blazed against the encroaching night. With each step towards the exit, her posture straightened, shedding the weight that had bowed her moments before. Now there was only the resolute stride of a warrior tempered by trials, a demon fighter prepared to reclaim what was lost. She crossed the threshold of the church, leaving behind the echoes of serenity, ready to confront the chaos that awaited her beyond those hallowed doors, for Raymond, for herself, for all that she held sacred. The air was cool and crisp that evening, and the sunset was casting an orange glow as Ashland drove down Telegraph Road. She cracked the windows to feel the autumn breezes as she drove home in silence leaving the radio off and considering the tasks she was going to tackle the next morning. Ashlyn had put off meeting with Sierra Miller for two weeks. Father Sixtus would call her that night for an update, and she'd have to tell him she still hadn't made it to Sierra's home. Time was of the essence. Sierra was pregnant and in danger of losing her child to a demon. She'd been reluctant to work with Father Sixtus, and he thought Ashlyn would be the perfect person to access the case. Eager to carry out the responsibilities of her position, Ashlyn had accepted the task before learning who was involved. When she heard Sierra Miller's name, her heart began to race. 
It had been well over a decade since she'd heard the name Sierra Miller, and although it might be common, she instantly knew who Father Sixtus was referring to. You know her? Father Sixtus asked. Ashlyn had slowly nodded her head. I do. Then you will take care of this quickly, correct? The young woman came to me begging for help, but she is very suspicious of the church, especially of priests. Since you know her, you already have an in. Ashlyn considered telling Father Sixtus that she could not take this case. She still had nightmares about the last time she dealt with the Millers, but she'd agreed to this calling. Ashlyn had accepted the task of helping the church weed out the demonic obsessions and infestations that could be fixed with deliverance prayers. She would refer those that needed exorcism to the archdiocese's exorcist. The first case she tackled had been challenging, but once she turned it over to God, her fear dissipated. But when it came to the Millers, she was afraid of more than spiritual evil. She shuddered when she thought about her ex-boyfriend, Marcus Miller, who was currently serving 15 to 60 years on first-degree criminal sexual conduct. Ashlyn still felt guilty for not pressing charges against him for what he'd done to her. Perhaps he wouldn't have been on the street to hurt the innocent child he'd offended against if she'd spoken up. It was something she deeply regretted. Father Sixtus, I don't know if I'm the right person for this job. His brow creased, and he titled his head as if he didn't understand what she'd said. You think this is a job? Well, um, it's a calling, a holy calling that you accepted. You could have said no, but you accepted. This isn't a nine to five. You can't just call in and say, hey, not today. See you tomorrow. That's not what I'm doing. Ashlyn said her voice raised. Sometimes she forgot Father Sixtus was a priest. He looked like a high school senior. Razor thin, with a tall, lanky body, it could be easy to forget that he was an adult and a priest. I will do this, but I need some time to prepare. Do you still think you're the one in control? No. I understand I am not the one pulling the strings. Good. None of us have that type of power, Father Sixtus said. Then why do you need time? Ashlyn wasn't sure what extra time would do, other than to remind her of the past, but she wanted it anyway. My brother is still missing, and I just need a little time to digest everything that's happened with the Danvers, the Nyen Rogue, and that I'm basically a demon fighter now. Father Sixtus held up his index finger. No. You're not a demon fighter. You are a soldier for Christ, who is going out on the front lines and helping the church diagnose what we have out there. We can't realistically locate and evaluate everyone who needs help. There aren't enough priests, and sadly, some priests don't even believe the demonic can infect people. Ashlyn Breyer, we need you and I respect and admire that you've answered the calling, but you must act now. Father Sixtus was right. After years of praying for guidance and a meaningful path in her life, the Lord had delivered. Turning down assignments was a non-negotiable. The church needed her to help do God's work in the world. Who was she to say no? Her mind moved back to the present, as she made a left turn onto Trinity Street. Ashlyn had lived in Brightmoor for eight years. She'd purchased the small bungalow during the financial crisis in 2008. The housing market in Michigan had collapsed, opening a door for her to buy a house on her meager teacher salary. The white clapboard house had cost her $3,500. Two bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a finished basement. She'd spent the next few years fixing little things around the house, but the couple that had lived in the house for 30 years had kept it up well, so the repairs were modest. It had been a brilliant move and one day in the future, Ashlyn hoped she could sell the home for a profit. In the meantime, she vigilantly watched for trouble, which was common in Brightmoor, and she kept to herself. She parked in her driveway and scanned the neighborhood. The place was full of strange faces that often were peddling drugs, sex or something else. Whenever she came home, it was important to search for lurching bodies in front of her place. One this evening, the darkness was quiet and still. She got out of the car and headed for the front door. Bruno and Rex were waiting for her, jumping and yelping with joy when she walked into the house. She stroked their heads and greeted them with a soothing voice. Hey. I miss you too today. How about a treat? Ashlyn said, heading for the kitchen. The dogs followed her into the kitchen. Bruno stood on his hind legs begging, while Rex waited patiently on all fours. Ashlyn doled out two treats apiece. 
Her phone vibrated in her pocket. She pulled it out and hesitated. It was Father Sixtus. Father, I was going to call you this evening. Ashlyn said, preempting him from saying anything. I need to see you. Okay. I can come to the parish tomorrow. It can't wait. Come to the parish as soon as you can. Father Sixtus ended the call before she could say any more. 3. Ashlyn headed to Precious Blood Catholic Church deep on the west side of Detroit. The beautiful sandstone parish sat amidst shuttered storefronts and empty houses. The church had survived rounds of closures by the Archdiocese of Detroit, and despite the decline in the neighborhood, the school and parish other remained open. Father Sixtus had been at Precious Blood for ten months, and he'd only been a priest for two years. Young and passionate about his vocation, he wore a constantly creased brow and spoke in quiet, serious sentences. Ashlyn watched him from a distance as he spoke with a group of students, his thin arms folded over his lanky body. She waited for him to give the kids his signature head nod before heading in his direction. Every tap of her shoes had felt like an accusation, a reminder that she had put off meeting with Sierra Miller for two weeks. Ashlyn felt guilty, but she was still struggling to face her past. The memories of the horrific year she'd spent dating Sierra's uncle still haunted her. But she'd agreed to the calling to help the church, and she'd been praying for guidance for years. Now she had her orders. Would she live up to them or not? She drew in a breath as she locked eyes with Father Sixtus. A weak smile creased her lips. Come to my office, Fr. Sixtus said in a gentle yet firm voice. Ashlyn followed him down the long, narrow hallway past a set of small offices. At the end of the hallway, Father Sixtus pushed open a heavy mahogany door. His office was exactly how Ashlyn expected it would be. Severely organized with neat stacks of books and papers on the bookshelves and desk. An uncomfortable-looking chair was behind the desk, while a reclining chair was in the corner for guests. Sit, he said, motioning towards the beige recliner. Ashlyn sank into the plush fabric, the soft yet firm cushions gently hugging her body. Father Sixtus eased into the seat across from her. Father, I... Ashlyn's voice trailed off as she met his gaze. Take your time, Ashlyn, Fr. Sixtus said, his tone patient, his eyes kind. But do be clear when you speak. I need to know where things stand with the case. Guilt washed over her. Not only had she put off important business, she also had allowed Marcus's shadow to loom large in her mind. His face and voice moved in and out of her thoughts throughout the day, like a specter threatening to consume her peace. Father, it's about the Millers again, she said, her words barely a whisper. It felt like admitting a defeat, a step back into a darkness she'd promised herself she'd escaped. Fr. Sixtus watched her, his expression unchanging. She appreciated how calm he was. He was a young and fiery priest, but as she sat across from him, she realized he was rapidly maturing. This is about Sierra, he breathed. Ashlyn nodded. Helping her, it means facing him again. Even if he's locked away, his influence. Her voice cracked, betraying the fear she fought so hard to keep at bay. You must give up your own fears. Fr. Sixtus's voice was firm but soothing. Use your courage and your faith. But is my faith enough, Father? She asked, the question hanging between them heavy and foreboding. The weight of choices yet to be made filled the silence that followed. Ashlyn Breyer stood on the precipice of decision, caught between the pull of her calling and the chains of her past, while the church held its breath around her. This isn't a job. You can't just pick which cases you take. It's all or nothing, Ashlyn. I don't think of it as a job. Then why are you giving yourself the choice to not meet with Sierra? She's in trouble. Her child is in trouble. Soon it will be too late. Now I need to know, can you do this or not? You don't know what it was like to be with Marcus. No, but I don't have to. I know what it is like to have a calling from the Lord on my life, and that guides me. You've accepted what the church has asked, but if you can't fulfill your duties, you need to tell me now. The prospect of helping fight for the kingdom of God filled Ashlyn with excitement, but there was so much at stake. Ashlyn had hidden the woman she was when she dated Marcus for years, but was she really gone? It was hard to tell. You're going to adoration, right? Yes. Brushing up on your Latin? Absolutely. 
What about the physical training? Not as much physical training as I should have. You have dogs? Take them out for a run. They'll provide safety and help you get an exercise. How about sugar? Are you steering clear of it? Ashlyn thought about the heaping bowl of chicken Alfredo she'd had the previous evening for dinner, and the ice cream cone she'd indulged in the night before. A healthy dose of carbohydrates helped keep the loneliness at bay. I could have a better diet, she responded. The enemy will attack from any angle. You need to fortify yourself as much as possible. If you need help, I'm here. She looked up at Father Sixtus. What type of help are you offering? Be here by 5.30 every morning and I will run with you. You're welcome to stay for breakfast too. Four slices of bacon, two eggs and black coffee every Monday to Thursday and Saturday and Sunday. One Friday I fast, so I start off the day with coffee vegetable broth for lunch and a single tuna cake for dinner on watercress and kale for dinner. I never have to wonder what I'm going to eat, so temptation doesn't slip in. What if I want something else? Discipline, Ashlyn. Discipline. It doesn't matter if you want something else, you eat the bacon and eggs and savory the black coffee. When you fast, you miss the protein and look forward to it when you can have it again on Saturday. You know what that does? Creates gratitude. Exactly. There are people in the world who would love to have one slice of bacon, but all they have is gruel. Ashlyn, you know the lessons and how to learn them, but it's up to you to implement them in your life. Ashlyn felt empowered by his words. Discipline would help her overcome the fear she felt about facing her past. I might take you up on the runs on the weekends. Great. You know where I'll be. Now can I count on you to see Sierra soon? Yes. I promise. How soon? Tomorrow. Father Sixtus smiled. Good. That will work. Now before you leave, I think it is a good idea to discuss why you've had so much apprehension. Is this like confession? Well it's a conversation that will stay between us, but it's not the sacrament of reconciliation. Just tell me, what has you so apprehensive about this case? Ashlyn sighed and steadied herself before speaking. I've done a little research on Marcus Miller. For my safety, I check the prison website every year to make sure he hasn't gotten out on parole. So far no parole hearings, but if one pops up, I probably will be there because he is someone who needs to be confined for the rest of his life. He was extremely abusive when we were together. When I tried to leave, he did everything in his power to stop me. Back in college when we dated, I was unaware that his family was immersed in the occult. Now he has become involved in a religious group in prison. Brianna, Sierra's mother, is also involved in this group. I don't even know if they have a name, but they are using elements of the comedic system of beliefs and what is commonly known as voodoo. Sadly, this is becoming more common. Be careful with these folks. They are mixing the occult with drug dealing. Now that Marcus Miller is in prison, his sister is running the family drug empire. She's using witchcraft to make sure that things go her way. It doesn't work, of course, which is why both of her sons are in prison along with Marcus and her younger brother is on drugs. I hate that this comedic thing is catching on. Father Sixtus picked up on the hint and asked, Have you heard from your brother yet? No. He still isn't answering his phone, and I haven't been able to find him in the usual places. I will continue to pray for his return, Father Sixtus said. Speaking of which, make sure you pray before you go. Ask for help from our Lord. I also recommend that you go when the sister is not home. She is usually gone in the early morning and the evenings. I'll be there at 7 tomorrow, Ashlyn said. Very well. Report back as soon as you can. Ashlyn woke up early the next morning to a noise that immediately put her on alert. It sounded like someone was attempting to enter through her bedroom window. Her dogs were already barking furiously, and she could feel her heart race as she quickly assessed the situation. In one swift motion, she sat up in bed, grabbed her Sig Sauer from the top drawer of her bureau and made her way towards the window with Bruno and Rex following closely behind. She cautiously pulled back the curtains and positioned herself defensively, ready for whatever may come through the window. Ash. It's me. 
As the voice sunk in, Ashlyn lowered her gun. It was her brother, Raymond. Raymond, what are you doing here at this hour? Ashlyn questioned, her heart still pounding from the adrenaline rush of thinking an intruder was breaking in. Raymond. I. I needed a place to go. Things are getting dicey back at my place, Raymond muttered, avoiding his sister's gaze. Ashlyn frowned, knowing all too well about her brother's struggles with addiction and the occult practices he had been dabbling in. Come to the front door, she said through the window. Ashlyn put the gun back in the drawer and rushed towards the door. I've been worried sick about you, Ashlyn said, pulling the door open. Sorry. Things got crazy for a while. Can I stay here today while you're at work? Yes, but Ray, you can't keep running away from your problems like this. You need to get your act together, Ashlyn scolded, though concern laced her words. Raymond nodded, looking slightly ashamed. I know, I know. I just... I can't seem to get a grip on things, he admitted, shuffling his feet. Ashlyn sighed, knowing she couldn't abandon her brother, but she was tired of his downward spiral. She led Raymond to the living room and poured him a cup of tea, trying to think of ways she could help him turn his life around. As he sat on the couch, fidgeting nervously, Ashlyn couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had settled in her stomach. There was something off about Raymond's demeanor, something darker than just his struggles with addiction. Raymond, look at me, Ashlyn said firmly, her eyes locking onto his. I need you to be honest with me. Are you involved in something dangerous? Has anything strange happened? He shrugged his shoulders. Life is hard but I'm starting to get things together. You look like you know something. What's going on? That ring you had? I got rid of it. What? My property? How could you do that? Raymond said, standing up from the couch, anger filling his eyes. It was evil. Listen Raymond, I need you to leave the rituals you've been involved in has to stop. Are you still messing around with Reiki and all that stuff? Raymond's eyes widened in surprise, a flicker of guilt passing through them before he looked away. I. I may have dabbled a bit, he admitted, his voice barely above a whisper. Ashlyn's heart sank. She knew firsthand the dangers of dealing with forces beyond one's control, and she feared for her brother's safety. Raymond, stop. Your life will not be good until you stop dealing with these dark forces. Raymond shifted uncomfortably, guilt and shame clear on his face. He knew he had crossed a line, but the thrill of the unknown and the promises of power had gripped him tightly. Ashlyn could see the internal struggle playing out on her brother's features, torn between his desire for change and the pull of darkness that beckoned to him. Ray, I'm not saying this to control you but to protect you. Those things you've been dabbling in, they're dangerous. I've seen things felt things evil things. Ashlyn's voice took on a somber tone as she recounted some of her past encounters with demonic forces. Raymond's eyes met hers, a mix of fear and defiance swirling within them. I didn't think it would go this far, Ash. It started as a curiosity, a way to escape, but now I don't know how to stop, he confessed, his shoulders slumping under the weight of his words. Raymond's face looked weathered. Ashlyn felt like she'd done her best to get the message across. Hopefully, he was listening. Maybe he would come to church with her that weekend. She wasn't sure where things were going, but she needed to get ready for work. You can stay here today. The guest room is ready and there's some food in the fridge. But while I'm gone, try to make a plan. Maybe it's time to look up some residential treatment centers. Maybe you can find one that's a short stay. I'm sure mom and dad will be happy to pitch in. So will I. He looked disappointed that she'd mentioned treatment, which told her Raymond probably wasn't ready to make the change yet. Rome wasn't built in a day, she thought. 4. The clamor of fifth graders, each immersed in their own little world of pencils and notebooks, filled the classroom. Ashlyn Breyer circled among the desks, her eyes scanning the pages under busy hands, offering praise and gentle corrections with equal measure. She kneeled beside a young boy who had been struggling in math. His brow creased with concentration. Excellent job on the decimals, Javier, she said, her hand lightly touching the page. I'm very proud of you. Brightening, Javier nodded, his pencil dancing across the paper with renewed confidence. Ashlyn rose and continued her rounds, her heart swelling with the silent joy that always accompanied the light bulb moments of her students. 
As the class worked diligently, Ashlyn glanced at the clock. It was nearly time for their daily reflection, a moment she cherished for its quietude and contemplation, a stark contrast to the sinister shadows she battled beyond these walls. Okay, everyone, Ashlyn announced, her voice carrying softly over the murmur of activity. Let's take a pause from our work and gather for our reflection. The shuffling of chairs and the muted thuds of books closing became the symphony of transition as the children formed a semicircle on the carpet. Ashlyn took her place at the front, the morning sunlight filtering through the blinds and casting stripes of gold across her face. Today, I'd like us to think about what we're most grateful for, she began, her gaze sweeping over the attentive faces. When I'm feeling down or having a bad day, gratitude helps bring my spirits up. Miss Breyer, a soft voice interrupted. It was Shayna, her hands folded neatly in her lap. Yes, Shayna. I'm grateful for you. Ashlyn couldn't hide the flood of emotion. Her lip quivered and her eyes filled. She hadn't expected that at all. Shayna, thank you so much. I am grateful for all of you. Students are my favorite thing about being a teacher. She paused, her mind briefly wandering to the darkness she fought against, the malevolence that never seemed to show mercy. I'm grateful for my parents, but they didn't take me to get ice cream last night like they promised, so I'm kind of mad at them too, Colton said. Ashlyn smiled and pushed the dark thoughts out of her head. I'm sure there was a good reason for that. Parents have a lot of responsibilities, so we need to give them grace, right? The children nodded. Just like how patient you are with us, even when we make mistakes? Javier asked. Exactly, Ashlyn smiled, feeling the weight of her pendant, a tiny silver cross against her chest. We all make mistakes. But through patience and understanding, we learn and we forgive. That's a big part of what it means to be Catholic, to forgive, to love, and to shine a light in the darkness. The rest of the children stated what they were grateful for. Afterwards, a reverent hush fell over the room as Ashlyn stood with her students and made the sign of the cross, her students mimicking the gesture. With heads bowed and eyes closed, they entered a moment of prayer, led by Ashlyn's confident yet gentle voice. Heavenly Father, guide us in your wisdom to be beacons of kindness in this world. Help us remember the value of every person, and to treat others with the love and respect you have shown us. Amen. Amen, the chorus of youthful voices echoed. Ashlyn stood in front of the whiteboard, surveying her students to make sure everyone was listening. What she had to say was more important than all the math and English lessons they learned. Faith, Ashlyn began in a low, firm voice, is not just about believing in what we cannot see. It's about courage. The courage to stand for what is right, to hold on to virtue when it would be easier to let go. She stood still for a few moments, her eyes moving from one child to the next. The children, with an array of curious eyes and youthful innocence, watched her intently. Ashlyn wanted her students to not only hear the words, but also feel them. After letting the words sink in, she took a few steps closer to the rows of desk. Let us pray, she said softly, folding her hands in front of her body and bowing her head. The children followed her lead, mirroring Ashlyn's reverence. As she closed her eyes, the rest of the world seemed to fall away, leaving only the hushed cadence of their collective devotion. Our Father who art in heaven. Ashlyn's voice was the anchor, steady and sure. One by one, the young voices joined in, a chorus of sincerity that swelled within the walls of the classroom. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, the children recited, their belief untarnished by the shadows of the world outside. For Ashlyn, this was more than a daily ritual, it was a promise, a vow to shield these young souls with the armor of faith and virtue. And as Amen whispered from their lips like the final note of a divine symphony, Ashlyn knew that at least within these walls, her students found solace and strength. After the last echoes of prayer had settled like a comforting blanket over the classroom, Ashlyn Breyer moved among the small desks with a soft grace. She paused beside each child, their young faces upturned like sunflowers seeking light, as she offered words of encouragement and support tailored to their individual needs. Lawrence, she began, kneeling beside a boy whose furrowed brow hinted at troubles far weightier than his years should bear. Remember that story we read about David and Goliath? Just like David, you have the strength inside you to face any giant that comes your way. With a gentle hand on his shoulder, Ashlyn's reassurance seemed to lift the boy's spirits, a tentative smile breaking through the clouds of his anxiety. He nodded, 
clutching a pencil like a tiny warrior gripping his sling. She continued her rounds, whispering guidance, mending small heartaches with her patient listening, ensuring each child felt the warmth of being seen and understood. It was a delicate dance of compassion, the art of teaching intertwining seamlessly with silent vows of guardianship. As Ashlyn straightened from consoling Lily, who fretted over a lost pet, her gaze drifted to the corner of the room where a solitary candle flickered on a small altar, a symbol of faith's enduring flame. For a moment it brightened inexplicably, casting long shadows that danced across the crucifix above. A chill tiptoed down Ashlyn's spine, a whisper of otherness that momentarily stilled her heart. Her wire-framed glasses caught the glint of the strange light, and she tilted her head pondering the quiet anomaly. Though brief, it was enough, a subtle reminder of the unseen forces that threaded through her life, as constant and enigmatic as the divine mysteries she imparted to her students. Miss Briar? A timid voice called, snapping her attention back to the present. Yes, Anna. Ashlyn turned toward the girl, her demeanor unshaken, the fleeting brush with the supernatural tucked away like a secret between old friends. Can you help me with my project later? I want to make sure it's perfect. Anna's eyes were pools of earnestness, reflecting a desire for approval. Of course. We'll work on it together during study hour, Ashlyn assured her with a warm smile, her slender frame bending to scribble a note in her planner. The classroom buzzed with the muted sounds of children gathering books and shuffling papers, an innocent cacophony that grounded Ashlyn in the world she cherished, a world of teaching, of nurturing, of protecting. The flickering candle and its uncanny glow quietly receded into the backdrop of her daily vigil, while she focused on the precious lives entrusted to her care. Am I enough? she wondered. The question lingered in the air, mingling with the laughter and chatter of her students. It was a question that plagued her sleepless nights, the balance between two worlds, one of faith and virtue, the other of ceaseless vigilance against darkness. Was she the right person to spread the faith to the children? Miss Briar? The hairs on the back of Ashlyn's neck bristled at the sound of the voice, flat, devoid of the warm cadence of youth. She turned, coming face to face with Michael Tanner, one of her more rambunctious students. Something was amiss. The boy's eyes, once a lively hazel, were now pools of abyssal black, swallowing all light and hope. Michael? The name was but a whisper, a confirmation sought for the dread that unfurled within her. Michael isn't here right now. The voice that crawled from the boy's lips was guttural, scraping against the sanctity of the classroom like flint against steel. Instinct took hold. Ashlyn reached out, her slender fingers gripping the wooden cross that hung around her neck, an anchor amidst the storm of fear and doubt. With her other hand she deftly pulled a small vial of holy water from the pocket of her skirt, where it rested against her thigh, a silent sentinel. Exeab hoc corpore, spiritus immunde, she commanded, her voice steady despite the tempest inside her. The words were a lance of light, piercing through the shadows that loomed over her student. Michael, or whatever had taken residence within him, writhed before her, contorting in ways that defied nature. Ashlyn pressed on, her recitation growing more fervent, a litany against the encroaching darkness. Each word was a brick in the fortress she built around herself and her students. Per virtutum dei omnipotentis, te impero et expello. Her voice rose, a crescendo of resolve battling against the symphony of doubts that threatened to choke her spirit. The child staggered back, clawing at the air as if to tear apart the very fabric of the sacred space Ashlyn had created. The room chilled, a spectral draft that whispered of ancient evils and unspoken fears. Michael, hear me. Ashlyn's plea cut through the tumult, a lifeline thrown into the turbulent sea. Fight this. Your faith is stronger than any demon's lies. For a moment time seemed suspended, the world holding its breath. Then, with an expulsion of air that felt like the gust of a winter storm, the darkness fled from Michael's eyes leaving them bewildered and tear-filled. Miss Briar? The boy's voice was his own again, small and frightened. Before Ashlyn could respond, the door of her classroom creaked open and Principal Connor stepped in. Miss Briar? I need to see you in the hallway. How much did he see? Did he hear me? How do I explain myself, Ashlyn wondered as she excused herself from the classroom. In the hallway, Principal Connor cleared his throat and moved close to Ashlyn. What in the world were you doing in there? The principal whispered in a rushed voice. Ashlyn measured her response. The principal didn't know that a demon had taken Michael over. 
How was she going to explain her actions to her boss? Um, I... Was that Latin? Again? What did I tell you? We use English and English only in this school. Do you understand? Ashlyn considered reminding the principal that Latin was the official language of the church, but she held her tongue. The principal had warned her about using Latin with the students several times. Listen, I know you are serious about your faith and we appreciate that about you, but you can't bring your agenda into the classroom. Relieved that Principal Connor had no idea what she'd been doing, Ashlyn took the criticisms and promised not to use Latin again with the students. Great. Now that we have an understanding, I have to ask, how do you think we're going to swing having you leave for a few weeks? This is a school, Ms. Breyer. We need teachers to be here every day. I have not taken any sick days, sir. Yes, but I just don't owe Ashlyn. You're such a great teacher, but the extracurricular stuff has to go. I have found a substitute. Well, okay, but that's only half the battle. Father Zachary Hickman says he will cover my class. Principal Connor opened his mouth to protest but quickly closed it. Father Zachary was a favorite amongst students. He was technically retired, but because of excellent genes, as he put it, he was always eager to help around the diocese. Ashlyn had called him before, asking for the time off. You expect Father Zachary to be here for two weeks? He's already agreed to it. He flexed his jaw. There was no good argument to deny her the leave, but her boss didn't like to appear like he didn't have any other options when he was dealing with Ashlyn. I need to speak for Father Zachary before he comes in. Ashlyn nodded. Of course. Anything else, sir? Principal Connor shook his head reluctantly. No. Go back to work. In the dim candlelight of the monastery, Fr. Sixtus prayed for guidance. Managing Ashlyn's endeavors was difficult. He had only been a priest for five years. Was he managing his tasks well enough? Should he be doing more to support Ashlyn? But a presence that seemed to materialize in the shadowed corners of the chapel swiftly dispelled the doubts that crept into Father Sixtus's mind. A whisper soft as silk yet cold as ice slithered into his consciousness. You doubt your abilities, young priest a voice hissed, its words wrapping around Father Sixtus like tendrils of smoke. You question your purpose in this divine play. Father Sixtus knelt, his heart racing as he searched the chamber for the source of the voice. Go to the foot of the cross and receive your penance, he muttered, his voice trembling with a mixture of fear and defiance. A figure stepped from the darkness, its form a grotesque amalgamation of horned beast half female and half male, stepped out of the shadows. I command you to go to the foot of the cross and receive your penance. Father Sixtus said. This time his voice was firm. The creature evaporated before his eyes. He had to remember that the demons had no control over him. Not because he was a priest, but because he was human and a rightly ordered human life produced the tools to combat any demon. With a deep breath to steady his nerves and reaffirm his faith, Father Sixtus rose from his knees, the flickering candlelight casting shadows across his determined features. The encounter with the demon had only strengthened his resolve to stand against the darkness that threatened Ashlyn and the innocent lives at stake. In the chapel's stillness, a sense of purpose settled over him like a cloak of protection. He knew that his role in guiding Ashlyn and supporting her in this battle was crucial, and he would not falter in his duty. As he made his way out of the chapel, Father Sixtus felt a surge of determination coursing through him. There was much work to be done, much evil to confront, but he was not alone in this fight. With God's grace and the unwavering courage of those who stood by his side, they would prevail against the malevolent forces that sought to harm the innocent. 5. Ashlyn made sure all her students were picked up from school, before headed back to her classroom and preparing to leave for the day. After turning off the lights and locking her door, she pulled out her phone and scanned the directions to Sierra's house. It would take her about 20 minutes to make it across town at this time of day. She considered putting off going to Sierra's for one more day, but realized she couldn't put it off any longer. As she climbed into her car, the sun slid behind the clouds and the sky turned gray. The heavens roared with unrest as Ashland's car battled its way through the empty streets of Detroit, her knuckles white on the steering wheel. The wind was a living thing, malicious and unrestrained, 
clawing at the windows and howling like the demons she had faced in shadowed corners of her past. Rain hammered the roof of her modest sedan, a cacophony that drowned out even the fervent prayers that whispered from her lips. Sierra's house loomed ahead, an old Victorian silhouette against the storm's fury, its gables sharp and accusing against the turbulent sky. Ashlyn squinted through the torrent, her heart hammering as much from anticipation as from fear. She had to reach Sierra, protect her, offer solace amidst the chaos of her young life. As the tires splashed into the flooded driveway, a crack of thunder split the night, a prelude to catastrophe. A massive tree limb, ripped from its ancient trunk by the relentless wind, plummeted earthward, a dark specter aiming to crush all beneath it. Divine providence or mere chance, Ashlyn swerved, the limb crashing down mere inches from the rear bumper sending mud and shattered bark spraying up like shrapnel. Lord protect us, she breathed, a plea to the storm outside and the unseen battles within. Ashlyn threw open the door of her car, the wind immediately seizing upon her coat, threatening to wrench her back into the night's embrace. But her resolve was ironclad, steeled by years of facing down darkness in both human and ethereal forms. With head bowed against the assault, she sprinted to the porch, the rosary beads in her pocket a comforting weight against her thigh. Ashlyn's breath fogged in the chill air as she approached the dilapidated Miller home. The large Victorian loomed over the empty lots that previously held similar estates. The former grand neighborhood had fallen into disarray after the 1968 Detroit riots, and its once grand features were now marred by neglect. Windows cloudy with grime reflected the dying light. The garden, overgrown and wild, whispered of nature reclaiming what man had abandoned. Thorns clawed at Ashlyn's clothes as she made her way to the imposing front door. I hope this goes okay, Ashlyn murmured, her voice barely rising above the wind that moaned through the skeletal branches of the trees surrounding the house. Ashlyn's hand trembled as she reached out, lifted the heavy iron door knocker and dropped it against the heavy door. A shiver ran down her spine. She could feel the presence of something sinister even from outside the threshold, a palpable sense of dread that clung to the place like ivy. No one answered. She knocked again, harder this time, willing the sound to pierce the heavy silence that seemed to suffocate the house. A rustle came from within, footsteps faint but approaching. Ashlyn's pulse pounded in her ears, each thud sinking with the slow creak of the door that began to inch open. The door swung open. Ashlyn felt a flood of conflicting emotions, peered out from the gloom of the house's interior. A slight smile spread across Sierra's face. Hope sparked in her eyes before skepticism clouded it over like a rolling fog. Thank you for coming, Sierra said. Everyone else is gone, but they'll be back soon. We'll need to hurry. Ashlyn crossed the threshold, the door slamming shut behind her sealing them inside. For now they were safe from the elements, but Ashlyn knew all too well that some tempests brewed from within, their gales just as deadly as those that raged outside. Ashlyn's breath came out in visible puffs, her heart still racing from the harrowing dash through the storm. She watched Sierra pace across the confines of the dimly lit living room, the shadows cast by the flickering candles playing over the teenager's worried features. Despite the sanctuary from the howling winds, a chill lingered, seeping into Ashlyn's bones a chill that had nothing to do with the tempest outside. Ms. Miller, Ashlyn said, her voice steady despite the thumping in her chest. I will do my best to help you. Please tell me why you think you have a family curse. Call me Sierra, please. My mother and grandfather told me that there is a curse on the family. They say that if I leave, I will die, and my baby will be given to Baphomet. Hearing the demon's name spoken in such a casual manner, caused the hairs on the back of Ashlyn's neck to stand up. What does the curse entail? Sierra settled on the edge of an ancient sofa, its fabric worn by the passage of time. Her hands rested protectively over her swollen belly. I don't know all of it but, she began, her voice barely above a whisper betraying the tremors of her deepest fears. My grandmother died after she left us. So did my Aunt Nicole. Both of them died unexpectedly. What happened to your grandmother? Heart attack. And your Aunt Nicole? Same thing. Heart attack. Ashlyn remembered Marcus's sister Nicole. She'd been somewhat estranged from her family back in the early 2000s when Ashlyn dated Sierra's uncle. Has anyone else left the Millers behind? Sierra slowly shook her head. Everyone else has a tie to the family. To this house. The weight of her confession hung heavy in the air. 
Ashlyn sat beside her, a silent invitation for Sierra to continue. A long time ago, I don't even know when, we had some ancestors who joined this religious group that started here in Detroit. I don't know what it was called, but it involved ancestor worship. And yes, I've participated in that practice. Sierra's eyes shone with unshed tears, a testament to the struggle within. Generations upon generations, each child born into this world with a shadow looming over us. No one gets out alive. Those of us that stay pay the price. It's more than just bad luck or misfortune, it's a darkness that consumes our lives. Ashlyn reached out, her fingers brushing against the girl's arm with a comforting touch. Tell me about this curse, she urged gently, knowing that acknowledgement was the first step toward breaking any malevolent bond. It's like a poison in our bloodline, Sierra choked out, her breath hitching. As you know, my uncle Marcus, the one that hurt you, is in prison. My other uncle Darren is on drugs. He comes here sometimes to crash, but his life is terrible. My father was killed when I was a kid, and my mother has been married four times. And now, my mother has done something unforgivable. She promised my unborn daughter to Baphomet in exchange for. Say no more, Ashlyn interjected, a firm resolve setting her jaw. Her faith, though often tested, had never wavered, and she would not allow despair to take root. Promises made in darkness can be undone by the light. We will find a way. Sierra's gaze clung to Ashlyn, searching for the certainty she herself lacked. Can we? Really? Faith has power, Sierra, Ashlyn reassured her, her voice steady despite the turmoil that churned inside her. And I promise you, we'll fight this curse together. In the silence that followed, the storm outside seemed to hold its breath, as if waiting for the battle between light and darkness that was yet to come. Sierra rose from the tattered armchair, her movements stiff with a resolve that belied her sixteen years. I've tried to leave, she confessed, pacing across the creaky wooden floor as the wind outside howled like a chorus of the damned. Packed my bags and ran as far as my legs could carry me. Ashlyn watched the young girl's frenetic energy, seeing the desperation etched into the tense line of her shoulders. But they found you, she asked, her voice low. Every time. Sierra stopped abruptly, her hands clenched at her sides. Her eyes were wild, reflecting the flickering candlelight and the storm of emotions raging within. It's like they have a leash around my neck, yanking me back into this, this prison. Your family? Ashlyn prodded gently, though she already knew the answer. Uncle Marcus, Sierra spat the name like a curse. He always finds me. Says I'm carrying the future of the Millers, that I can't just abandon my responsibilities. But what about my daughter? What kind of life is this for her? Does Marcus know about the promise your mother made? Ashlyn inquired, dreading the answer. A bitter laugh escaped Sierra's lips. I don't know what he knows. The secrets in this house. She shook her head. They're like cobwebs in the corners, ever present but always overlooked until they're right in your face. Ashlyn stood and crossed the room to stand beside Sierra her presence a pillar of strength against the tempest both outside and within. Then we'll break the cycle, she declared, her tone brooking no argument. You're not alone anymore, Sierra. We'll find a way for you and your child to be free. Free, Sierra whispered, tasting the word as if it were a foreign concept. Hope fluttered in her chest, fragile as a sparrow's wings. Yes, I want that. For her if not for me. Ashlyn's steady gaze mirrored the determination that sparked in Sierra's eyes. Together, they formed an unspoken pact, a vow to defy the darkness that sought to claim the innocent soul yet to be born into the Miller legacy. The wind outside howled as if angered by their resolve, and the walls of the old house creaked in protest. Despite the cacophony, there was a sacred stillness between the two young women, an understanding that transcended words. Sierra's hands instinctively moved to cradle her swollen belly, protective and defiant. We will pray, but there is something else you must do, Ashlyn said gently. Anything, Sierra said. You have to change your life. Okay. Yes, I can do that. What type of changes? Well, Ashlyn began, knowing that this was something she had to be straightforward about. You need to embrace faith. You have to recognize God. Sierra sighed and crossed her arms on top of her bulging belly. I just want the curse gone? Can't we do that, and worry about what I believe later?" Ashlyn sighed. 
I'm sharing the steps that must be followed to break the curse. It's your choice what you'd like to do, but it's important to understand that this will not be easy or quick. For the first time since Ashlyn arrived, Sierra looked young and naive. Her eyes were eager. She just wanted to get rid of the curse and move on with her life. Please. Just help me. I don't want to lose my daughter, Sierra said, her voice desperate. Okay. Tell me about the most pressing issue. Why have you called me here today? My family has always spoken in hushed tones about the dark inheritance, Sierra began, her voice quivering with the weight of her confession. They say it goes back generations. It's like a stain on our souls, passed down to each new child born into the Miller line. And your mother, she promised your daughter to Baphomet? Ashlyn pressed, her heart aching for the fear and despair that must be clawing at Sierra. Before I even knew I was carrying her, Sierra admitted, tears brimming in her eyes. My mother promised her firstborn granddaughter to Baphomet. A vow made out of greed and desperation during one of my family's twisted rituals. Her gaze fell, and old shame and anger battled for dominance over her youthful features. She believes it'll bring us more power and wealth. But all I see is the darkness closing in, and now it's reaching for my baby. Then we won't let them have her, Ashlyn asserted, her words slicing through the despair like a beacon of light. Your daughter is not a pawn in their sick game. We'll protect her, Sierra. Whatever it takes. Sierra nodded, clinging to Ashlyn's promise as though it were a lifeline amidst the churning sea of her dread. Together they stood, a bulwark against the tempest of the night and the sinister legacy that sought to claim yet another innocent life. Rain battered the windows as if demanding entry, and the wind howled with an almost sentient rage. Inside the dimly lit living room felt like a sanctuary though the storm outside was nothing compared to the tempest unfolding within Sierra's heart. She paced, her movements restless, her hands clenching and unclenching in helpless frustration. I've tried to leave so many times, she confessed, her voice barely rising above the din of the storm. But they always find me. It's like they've marked me, claimed me as their own property. The idea made her feel sick, yet it held a ring of truth that she couldn't deny. Who? Ashlyn leaned forward, her eyes sharp with intent. Everyone, my uncle, cousins, even distant relatives I didn't know existed, Sierra replied, a bitter laugh escaping her lips. They come after me like bloodhounds, dragging me back to this prison of a house, telling me it's for my own good, for the family's legacy. Legacy. Ashlyn's brow furrowed at the word, a concept so often associated with pride twisted here into something dark and malevolent. Legacy or curse, call it what you will, Sierra said stopping her pacing to face Ashlyn squarely. It's all the same when it comes with chains. She hesitated then, as though weighing whether to share the darkest part of her burden. But there was no turning back now, not for her, not for the life growing inside her. My mother believes our family is special chosen, Sierra continued, her voice dropping to a whisper. When she found out about the baby, she saw it as a sign, an opportunity to renew our pact with Baphomet, to secure our place in his favor by promising your daughter to him. Ashlyn finished the sentence, her stomach churning at the thought. Sierra nodded, her face pale as a specter's. A renewal of vows made by ancestors we never even knew, whose decisions now haunt us from beyond the grave. She thinks giving my child to him will solidify our power, ensure prosperity. But what use is wealth when it's soaked in innocence and sin? The revelation hung heavy in the air between them, a grim shadow amidst the flickering light. Outside the storm raged on, oblivious to the human turmoil it mirrored. Ashlyn reached out, her fingers gently closing around Sierra's trembling hands. The younger girl looked so frail, so utterly consumed by the terror that gripped her. As Ashlyn reached out and gently closed her fingers around Sierra's trembling hands, she felt her heart ache for the innocence that had been stolen from her, knowing well the darkness she was up against. Have you ever been baptized? Ashlyn asked, her voice soft but steady. Do you have any religious background that might protect you? Sierra pulled her hands back to wrap her arms around herself, as though the question had ushered in a chill only she could feel. She shook her head slowly, her eyes hollow as she stared at the floorboards. Religion, faith, it was never a sanctuary for us, Sierra murmured. Our legacy is older, darker. In the forest, we perform rituals when the moon is full, or right before the spring equinox. 
What do these rituals entail? Ashlyn prompted, her mind racing as she pieced together the grim mosaic of Sierra's life. Old rites forgotten by time but preserved by blood, Sierra continued, her gaze distant. Some of our ancestors asked for help. Who did they ask for help? Sierra bowed her head. An entity. Your family has been entangled with this entity since then. Ashlyn pressed. Bound by a promise we never made but are forced to keep, Sierra confirmed. A chain that links every generation to the next, to him. It's why my mother believes my daughter must be given up. That's why we must ensure she is kept away from their influence. Ashlyn felt the weight of decades in Sierra's words. The storm outside lashed against the windows, a maelstrom of chaos mirroring the battle they were facing, a battle not just against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Then we must break this chain, Ashlyn declared. We will find a way, Sierra. You and your child shall not be claimed by such evil. Wind howled like a chorus of anguished spirits, battering the house as if seeking entry. Ashlyn's fingers curled around a small crucifix she wore hidden beneath her shirt, its edges biting into her palm, a reminder of the power she believed in. Thank you. I want my child to live a good life. Then it's settled, Ashlyn said, her voice barely rising above the roar of the storm. We will break this curse. Sierra's eyes flickered with a glimmer of hope, but fear quickly overshadowed it. You don't understand, she whispered. Each time we've tried to defy the pact, there have been consequences. Consequences? Ashlyn probed. She needed to know exactly what they were up against. Accidents. Misfortunes. Deaths. Sierra's voice trembled as much as the walls that shuddered under the storm's fury. The curse protects itself. Ashlyn nodded, understanding the nature of such dark packs. They would not relinquish their hold easily. But not all protection is infallible. We have powers of our own, she reassured. Like what? I've never seen any divine intervention saving us from this nightmare. Sierra spat out, the bitterness laced with years of disappointment. Faith, Ashlyn said firmly, her resolve unwavering. Prayer, sacraments, the support of those who can fight this battle alongside us. Fight? With what army? It's just you and me, Ashlyn. Sierra's laugh was hollow, devoid of humor. My family has chased me across states to drag me back. They won't stop until I'm locked back into this cursed legacy. It's not just you and I. There is a team behind the scenes waiting for my report. They will be the ones to do the footwork, but I am here too. I won't abandon you, Ashlyn stated, her mind racing through potential strategies. She thought of F.R. Baraka, who was the exorcist of the diocese's F.R. Sixtus whose upbringing might give him unique insight into this pagan curse. Even Raymond despite his troubles, had knowledge of the occult that could prove useful. Obviously she wouldn't involve him in any of the work to break the curse, but she would probe him for answers concerning the occult practices he was familiar with. There are people who dedicate their lives to fighting such darkness. We're not alone in this. Sierra bit her lip, considering. The wind subsided for a moment, as though the forces at play were listening, waiting to hear her decision. Tell me what to do, Sierra finally said, desperation creeping into her voice. I'll do anything to save my child from this. First, we protect you both with every holy safeguard we can muster, Ashlyn replied. Then we build our defenses, gather our allies, and strike at the root of this evil. Is that even possible? Sierra asked, skepticism warring with her longing to believe. With faith all things are possible, Ashlyn answered, her eyes burning with conviction. This ends now. As the words left her lips, the storm outside crescendoed once more as though in defiance. Yet within the room, amidst the sound of wind and wrath, there existed a newfound silence, a sacred space filled with determination and the promise of a fight for redemption. In that moment of solemn resolve, a sudden knock on the door shattered the fragile peace that had settled between Ashlyn and Sierra. The sound echoed through the house like a thunderclap, jarring them both from their intense conversation. Sierra's eyes widened in fear, her gaze darting towards the entrance as if expecting the very forces of darkness to come crashing through. Ashlyn, however, remained composed, her hand instinctively reaching for the concealed crucifix once more. Someone's here, Sierra whispered, her voice barely above a breath. 
Ashlyn motioned for her to stay put as she approached the door cautiously. With one hand on the doorknob and the other tightly gripping her crucifix, she took a deep breath before swinging the door open. Standing on the threshold was a figure cloaked in shadows, his features obscured by darkness. The dim light filtering through the storm clouds outside did little to reveal his identity. You have to go, Brianna said. My grandfather is here. Is there a back door? Ashlyn asked, rushing away from the front door. Yes. Follow me, Sierra said, standing up and grabbing Ashlyn's hand. As they crept towards the kitchen, they heard the lock click. The two women stopped and looked at one another. The front door slowly opened, heavy footsteps entered the house. Go? Now. Sierra whispered, pushing her out of the back door. Ashlyn rushed through the yard, scrambling into the alley and running until she made it to her car. 6. Ashlyn Breyer's hands trembled slightly as she unlocked the door to her modest home on Detroit's west side, the evening's chill creeping through her cardigan. The low growl of distant city sirens was a stark reminder of the neighborhood's dangers, a constant backdrop to her quiet existence with Rex and Bruno, who now greeted her with wagging tails and eager barks. As she hung her keys by the door, her mind wandered. Could she help Sierra if prayer and changing her life were off the table? She wasn't sure. Ashlyn's fingertips traced the scar hidden beneath her sleeve, a memento from the days when she had been entangled with Marcus. Every time she thought of him, it felt like a shadow came over her. Can I truly delve back into that darkness? She murmured to her reflection in the windowpane, the furrowed brow and wire frame glasses doing little to mask the weight of her decision. Hey, Raymond called from the hallway, startling her. Oh, Ray. I forgot you were here. I know. The fridge is pretty bare. What's for dinner? She silently prickled at the level of entitlement in her brother's voice. There was plenty of food in the house, but it had to be cooked. Raymond expected her to serve him. Beef stew, she muttered, headed for the kitchen. Rex and Bruno followed her, but Raymond headed for the spare bedroom. As she chopped celery, carrots and onions, Ashlyn thought about how she was going to tell Raymond that he needed to get a job or at least help out around the house if he was going to stay there. She was rehearsing a speech in her head when she heard mumbling. Ashlyn leaned against the kitchen counter, her gaze flitting from the simmering pot of beef stew to the hallway where Raymond had just slipped away. She was happy her brother was safe in her home, but he'd been so secretive since he'd returned. Ashlyn tried to push away the worry she felt, closing her eyes and inhaling the savory aroma of the meal she was making, but that did little to ease the knotted feeling in her gut. She hadn't missed how his eyes darted to the door every few minutes, or how his laughter sounded a touch too forced during dinner. Now, as her brother excused himself for the third time that evening, Ashlyn's intuition hummed with alarm. Ray, everything all right? She called after him, but he was already out of sight, his mumbled reply lost in the distance. From the corner of her eye, Ashlyn saw the shadow of her brother through the frosted glass panes of the back door. His silhouette merged and broke apart as he paced, phone pressed to his ear. Her hand tightened around the wooden spoon. She was used to Raymond keeping secrets from her, but his most recent past was concerning. He'd relapsed onto drugs and disappeared for weeks, and he was dabbling in the occult. Ashlyn stirred the beef stew and set the spoon down, wiping her hands on the apron cinched around her slender waist. With care she traversed the creaky floorboards of the narrow hallway, stopping a breath away from the back door. The murmur of Raymond's voice filtered through, hushed yet urgent. Ashlyn strained to listen, her wireframe glasses slipping down the bridge of her nose as she leaned closer. Can't talk now. Yes, I'll be there. Was he on the phone? Who was he talking to? The finality in Raymond's tone was unmistakable. Ashlyn peeked into the room. Raymond was standing in the middle of the room, staring at the wall. There wasn't a phone in his hand. She scanned the room, even though it was clear Raymond was alone in the room. Ashlyn retreated to the kitchen, her mind churning. What had Raymond gotten himself into? She contemplated how to approach the situation. She wanted to inquire about who he was talking to, but she knew that would not go over well. Raymond became aggressive if she asked about his private life. At the end of dinner, she would casually ask him who he was talking to in the bedroom. She took a deep breath and headed for the cabinets above the counter, grabbed two bowls. On her way back to the stove, 
she caught a glimpse of Raymond in the hallway. His lips were moving but Ashlyn couldn't hear what he was saying. She pretended not to notice and proceeded to scoop stew into the bowls. After setting both bowls on the table, she reached for her phone and opened a note-taking app. Every detail mattered. The times of his departures, the length of his absences, the cryptic snippets of dialogue she'd accidentally overheard. Ashlyn started typing, her fingers moving with purpose. If Raymond wouldn't confide in her willingly, then she'd piece together the truth herself. Stew's ready, she said as Raymond re-entered the kitchen, feigning nonchalance. Ah yeah, he replied, scratching the back of his head, avoiding her steady gaze. Everything okay? She asked, careful not to make eye contact with Raymond. Just had to sort something out. Anything I can help with? The offer hung between them, sincere and laden with inspoken concern. No, it's nothing, he assured her, though the slight quiver in his voice betrayed him. All right then, Ashlyn conceded with a nod, her expression softening to mask the unease that twisted inside her. As she turned back to the stove, her thoughts were anything but calm. She would get to the bottom of whatever was haunting her brother, even if it meant delving into the darkness that seemed to have ensnared him. After dinner, Raymond excused himself, telling Ashley that he was going out for a while. Don't wait up, he said, heading out the door before she could ask any questions. Bruno and Rex watched Raymond leave, then they both looked at Ashlyn. You're right. I need to follow him. She pulled on a black hooded sweatshirt, grabbed her keys and rushed out the door. Ashlyn peered into the darkness, looking both ways down the street. At first she thought Raymond was long gone, but she spotted a dark silhouette in the distance. Ashlyn rushed in his direction. The streetlights flickered above as Ashlyn trailed behind Raymond, her breath fogging in the chill night air. He had left the house with that same furtive glance over his shoulder, a signal that had become all too familiar to her watchful eyes. She dodged into the shadows whenever he paused or glanced back, her heart pounding not just from the exertion but also from dread. Raymond's path took unexpected turns, leading away from the glow of the inconsistent streetlights and into a dark section of the neighborhood. Brightmore had experienced a spat of firebombing in the early 2000s. Some blocks had one or two houses left, but the city decided that some streets would not have working streetlights because there weren't many residents living on those blocks. Ashlyn hesitated, but Raymond continued his body moving in a robotic manner, she said a quick prayer and continued. She crouched behind the husk of a long-abandoned Monte Carlo that had been stripped, but the doors were still intact, giving Ashlyn cover. Peering through its rusted frame, she saw Raymond beneath the skeletal branches of a dead oak. He was talking with figures draped in dark cloaks, their faces obscured by the edges of hoods in inadequate moonlight. From her concealed vantage point she recognized them, one was Sierra's grandfather and other was Marcus. Ashlyn's mouth dropped. She'd confirmed that Marcus was in prison before she started working with Sierra. What was he doing standing under a tree talking to her brother? Why was Raymond with the Millers? Are you certain she doesn't know we're meeting? Sierra's grandfather pressed, his voice barely rising above the wind. Absolutely, Raymond replied, the surety in his tone slicing through Ashlyn like a shard of ice. She trusts me completely. And the priest? Another figure asked, his posture rigid with authority. Sixtus is a fool, Raymond scoffed, his voice deeper than normal. He thinks he's playing chess, but he's merely a pawn in our game. How did Raymond know Fr? Sixtus, Ashlyn wondered. He didn't attend church and Fr. Sixtus was relatively new to the archdiocese. The hairs stood up on the back of her neck as she considered that her brother may have gotten the information from. Their laughter, dark and conspiratorial, bounced off the mangled remains of houses burned out houses. Ashlyn's mind raced. The implications were clear. Her own brother was ensnared in something sinister, a plot that entangled her and Father Sixtus. Ashlyn's hand clenched around the small crucifix that hung from her neck, a gesture of comfort and a silent plea for strength. As the group disbanded, Sierra's grandfather and Marcus retreated into the darkness from which they had emerged. But Raymond remained, staring up at the moon with an expression that was both triumphant and haunted. Ashlyn's throat tightened with unspoken questions. She would confront Raymond, yes, but not tonight. For now, she needed to retreat, to gather her strength and seek counsel from those few she still hoped she could trust. With one last look at her brother's solitary figure, Ashlyn slipped away into the night, 
her mind ablaze with the searing heat of betrayal and the cold, gnawing fear of the unknown. The next morning a thick fog of disbelief hung over Ashlyn. She sat at her worn kitchen table, her hands folded in her lap, hoping that prayer could somehow reorder the world into one where her brother wasn't conspiring with her archenemies. Her wireframe glasses lay forgotten beside an untouched cup of coffee, and her dogs lounged at her feet, picking up on her distress with occasional worried whines. How do I bring this up to Raymond? She whispered to herself, her voice barely audible. The memory of the previous night's discovery haunted her, replaying in her mind like a sinister film loop. The image of Raymond standing beneath the moonlight, his face alight with secretive knowledge, was etched into her psyche. She rose stiffly from the table, propelled by a force greater than herself, it was time to confront her brother. Raymond! Ashlyn's voice cut through the morning air, sharp and clear. He was in the spare bedroom, sitting on the floor against the edge of the bed. He turned to face her, his expression unreadable. She closed the distance between them. I followed you last night, she said, her eyes searching his face for any sign of the brother she thought she knew. I saw who you met with. Raymond looked away, his jaw tense. Ashlyn, this is bigger than you understand, he began, but she cut him off, her voice rising in anger and hurt. Why are you associating with the Millers? You know what Marcus did to me. Why would you betray me? Things have changed, Ashlyn, Raymond said, his words slow and heavy. There are forces at play here, powers that you can't begin to comprehend. Try me, she challenged, her slender hands balled into fists at her sides. Tell me why you meet with the Miller men, and why you're plotting with them. Tell me why I shouldn't fear for your soul. You think you know what's happening, but you don't see the whole picture. Raymond shot back, the facade cracking, revealing a glimpse of desperation. Then tell me, Raymond, Ashlyn pleaded, her anger giving way to a profound sense of loss. Help me understand. He hesitated, his gaze drifting to the crucifix that hung around her neck. I can't. Not yet. His voice was a mere whisper. Until you can, I have nothing more to say to you, Ashlyn said, turning on her heel, her heart breaking with each step she took away from him. She stopped when she reached the doorway. And Raymond? Yes? Start looking for a place to live. Ashlyn left the room before he could respond. Tears ran down her cheeks. This was the first time in her life she'd rejected her brother in this way. It hurt, but she couldn't have him in her house. Not if he had embraced dark forces. 7. The next morning she headed to work, distracted by what she'd seen the previous evening. How could Marcus be out in the world, while simultaneously being in prison? Could he bi-locate? She sent Father Sixtus a text that morning, telling him she needed access to the library in his office and cemetery. He responded with, What happened? She quickly tapped out a summary of what had taken place the night before. Father Sixtus okayed her trip, but informed her he wouldn't be able to get there until late in the evening and sent her the code to the door. After work she headed home. Raymond was not there but his things were still neatly piled up in the guest bedroom. Ashlyn said a quick prayer before heading to the cemetery. Holy Sepulchre was a cemetery where Father Sixtus kept an office with a secret door that led to a library full of books about curses and the occult. Ashlyn typed in a code to the door and entered the dimly lit room. The walls were lined with books and maps. She retrieved a worn leather satchel from the hall closet. It emitted a soft creak as she opened it, revealing its contents, a collection of texts on ancient rituals and exorcisms, some bearing the scuffs and stains of long use. Her slender fingers danced across the spines, selecting volumes with practice precision. Each title was another piece of the puzzle, another step towards unraveling the curse that held Sierra's unborn child in its menacing grasp. As she piled the books high upon an ancient oak table, the flicker of overhead lights cast long shadows across the pages, lending an ominous air to her research. Let's see what secrets you hold, she whispered to the texts, emboldened despite the creeping unease that curled around her heart. Ashlyn settled into the chair, her frame small but unyielding, as she began to sift through the ancient lore, armed with nothing but her faith, her intellect, and a determination to face whatever lay ahead. The ancient texts sprawled before Ashlyn like a map of the arcane, their yellowed pages filled with archaic symbols and cryptic Latin phrases. She leaned closer, her wire-frame glasses sliding down the bridge of her nose as she scrutinized every detail. 
The musty scent of the old library mingled with the lingering incense that clung to her clothes, a testament to the hours she had already spent in contemplation and prayer. Her fingers traced the intricate illuminations, each line and curve a potential key to unlocking the curse. Murmuring under her breath, she translated the Latin aloud, the words feeling both foreign and familiar on her tongue. It was a linguistic dance between the present and the ancient world, each step bringing her closer to understanding the dark ritual that had ensnared Sierra's lineage. My great-grandmother knows more about the curse than anyone. Sierra's words echoed in her head. As she flipped through the pages, she read about family curses. Now that Sierra was missing, she needed more information than general instructions on how to help break the curse. The door slid open while Ashlyn was listening to Sierra being abducted. Father Sixtus stepped in and stopped the moment he entered the room. Their eyes locked and both of them listened. You were born for this. Be grateful, another male voice said. A door slammed and the sound on the other end of the phone stopped. They're taking her to Stevensville. I have to follow them, but before I do, I'm going to Louisiana. Ashlyn had been to New Orleans once during college for Mardi Gras. She remembered the humid nights spent on Bourbon Street collecting beads, an event she regretted now. Luckily, she'd committed her most egregious indiscretion before social media was a big thing. As she arrived at the airport, Ashlyn watched the palm trees sway slowly in the heavy air as she reflected on how much she changed. She'd never truly been a party girl, but depression had caused her to look for an outlet. Self-destruction had been her slave. One night stands, drunken nights spent on unfamiliar couches had all been attempts to soothe her soul. Now she knew there was only one way to ease the pains of life. As Ashlyn stepped out of the airport, the nostalgic smell of Cajun spices and sweet magnolias enveloped her. Despite the familiarity of the scents, she felt a sense of unease creeping up her spine. She rented a blue Ford Focus, pulled up directions on her phone, and headed to the miller's old plantation house on the outskirts of town. Ancient oak trees lined the winding roads, their branches creating a canopy overhead that blocked out the sunlight. She arrived at the former Grand Estate just after seven that evening. Ashland pulled beside an enormous willow tree and parked in its shade. The horizon looked like it was on fire. The house loomed before her, its once majestic facade now weathered and worn with time. Long thick grass and unkempt trees overgrew the expansive grounds. A set of tall, heavy double doors emerged from behind vines and rose bushes. Ashlyn climbed the stairs carefully and lifted the large door knocker, dropping it twice against the oak door. The sound echoed through the empty property. When no one answered, she knocked a second time. Ashlyn was confident that Sierra's belief that her great-grandmother held the keys to the curse was accurate. She had assumed that meant that place was occupied, but maybe the answers wouldn't come from a person. Maybe the house itself held the knowledge she needed. Taking a deep breath, Ashlyn pushed open the creaking door. She stepped into a large room full of furniture covered with blankets. She pulled out her phone and turned on the flashlight function, scanning the room. The air inside was musty and stale, but Ashlyn sensed something more. As the beam of light from her phone swept across the room, Ashlyn's heart skipped a beat when she noticed a figure standing in the far corner. A woman cloaked in a long black dress spread her thin arms out in front of herself. Her hands were angular and long and resembled claws. Her fuzzy white hair billowed around her shoulders. I've been waiting for you, the old woman croaked, her voice sounding like fingernails on a chalkboard. Sierra is in trouble. The woman lurched forward, slowly gathering the bottom of her dress into her hands and moving towards Ashlyn. There isn't much time left. They took her, didn't they? Ashlyn didn't respond. She knew Magda already knew what had taken place in Michigan. If you want to know what I know, I think it's only fair that I get to know what you know. Your granddaughter and great-granddaughter are in danger. They need your help. I've never had the pleasure of meeting my granddaughter. Do you know why? No. Ashlyn said, sensing that Magda wanted to tell her the story. I'd hoped that all of this would be over before she came of age, but too many people in the family want to keep all this mess going. Magda said, her voice full of resentment. I guess you're our best hope. Ashlyn heard the disbelief in Magda's voice. She didn't take offense. It was questionable if she could help Sierra. She seemed unwilling to do anything to combat the evil she was facing. 
Without her submission to God, there was little hope. I promise to do my best, but I need to know as much as possible. Magda reached out and curled her hand around Ashlyn's wrist, before leading her through the dimly lit corridors of the old plantation house. The floorboards creaked under their footsteps, and the air was heavy with the scent of decay and something sinister that sent shivers down Ashlyn's spine. Magda pulled her to the end of a long hallway, where a single candle flickered on an ancient wooden table. They entered a room that contained dusty bookshelves lined with tomes bound in cracked leather. This is where we keep the records of our family. We've been meticulously because we have to be, Magda said, her voice low and filled with sorrow. She pointed to a large book open on a stand in the center of the room. Ashlyn approached it cautiously, her hands trembling as she reached out to touch the yellowed pages. It began in the early 1800s, Magda said. A man named George Montague wanted to strike it rich in America. He came here in 1815 as a child with his parents from Haiti. His parents were wonderful, hard-working people, but they weren't rich. They worked day and night in the taverns on Bourbon Street, but George could see that they would never live in one of the grand houses. So he came up with a plan and by 1830, he owned all of this. She spread her arms and looked around with an air of nostalgia. Ashlyn could see how conflicted Magda was. She wasn't embracing the curse, but she also wasn't ready to reject it completely. What did George do to get this place? Magda nodded and a small smile slipped onto her crinkled lips. One night George was working alongside with his parents within a tavern. Some sailors came in and were rude to him. They called him names, threw beer in his face, and George felt humiliated. A woman named Elsa, known for palm reading and her ability to predict the future. She pulled George into a back room and told him there was a way out of the life he hated. That was how it all started. George began going with Elsa to a bayou after hours, gathering with a group that practiced an ancient faith. It has been called voodoo, but really, if you study the past, it is known as the Kemetic religion. Ashlyn's throat tightened. Her brother Raymond had told her he was practicing the Kemetic religion. Was he also involved in some type of curse? You know of it, don't you? Magda said, moving closer to Ashlyn. She wasn't sure how to respond. Yes, she knew what Magda was talking about, but didn't want to give the woman a reason to shift her focus from the matter at hand. Ashlyn also knew it was dangerous to trust Magda with too much information. She was, after all, operating in a gray area when it came to spirituality. I am familiar. Then you know it's dangerous, but very alluring. She nodded, but Ashlyn knew little about the belief system. Magda's eyes held a mix of sadness and pride as she continued her story. George was desperate for power and wealth, willing to do anything to escape poverty. Elsa taught him the ways of the Kemetic religion, the rituals and sacrifices. George embraced it all, believing he could bend the forces of nature to his will. Eventually he and Elsa married and moved to this grand house, building a sugar plantation that was rivaled by none. They were happy for some time, but there is always a price to pay when you meddle with such ancient powers. Ashlyn listened intently, her heart heavy with the weight of the dark history unfolding before her eyes. George made a pact with a spirit known as Baron Samadhi, the guardian of the dead in Haitian voodoo, Magda explained. In exchange for wealth and power, he promised the spirit his firstborn child, as a vessel for his dark energy. But George couldn't do it. He changed his last name, as if the demon could no longer find him because his had a different surname, stopped practicing rituals and tried to go without any spiritual guidance. He refused to give his firstborn Peter Miller his only son, to Baron Samadhi. As soon as he made the denial, his wealth dwindled. Elsa encouraged him to give their child to Baron Samadhi, and he punished them for years. Peter narrowly escaped being swept away in a storm one day. That was when Elsa pulled out her crystals and contacted Baphomet a demon she'd relied on in the past. Elsa so wanted to return to her lavish life that she made a deal to give the first grandchild of their fourth child to Baphomet. Why would she betray her child in that way? Well now that's the trick. Elsa thought she was smarter than the demon. She'd been told after her third child she would never have another child. That is why she promised the grandchild of the fourth child. Five years later, when Elsa and Peter had settled back into their usual routine, she realized she was expecting their fourth child. 
She worked her spells and thought that she'd defeated the curse, but many years later, when Maya the fourth child gave birth to her first son, the curse was carried out. Is there a fourth born in all the generations? Ashlyn asked. Magda smiled. No. Of course, future generations believe that they could simply avoid having a fourth child, but even if they only had one child, they had to turn the child over to Baphomet. Maya's son Ezekiel became a senator and was extremely wealthy. That was when the Millers leaned into the curse and we prospered. They renegotiated. If Baphomet promised endless wealth and success, then the Millers will give all children to the demon. A promise made, promise kept. It sounded too simple. Surely, someone in the family had rejected the evil presence that gave them power. Everyone, except for Agatha. Ashlyn could feel Magda's eyes roving over her face. The old woman wanted her to ask questions about Agatha, but Ashlyn sensed a hint of resentment in Magda's voice when she spoke of the one miller who had rejected the Baphomet's evil offer. Remember, this woman is neither friend or foe. She has her reasons for talking to you, but it's unlikely her intentions are good. Be careful, Father Sixtus told her before she traveled to Louisiana. Thank you for your help, Ashlyn said. I better start reading. She nodded at the tomes on the table. Hum, Magda said. How long are you here for? Ashlyn felt her heart quicken. Father Sixtus had told her to not inform Magda how long she would be in town because it could mean Magda was planning on concocting a spell to use on Ashlyn. Or it could be harmless. It was hard to tell what the intention was, but to be on the safe side, Ashlyn told Magda she wasn't in town for long. Do you have a flight book to return home? Magda asked. No. Hum. Well, I will leave you to read. I'll be down the hall if you need anything. Ashlyn watched Magda leave the room, feeling a sense of unease settling in her stomach. She knew she needed to be cautious around the old woman, especially after hearing the dark history of the Miller family's dealings with ancient powers. As she turned her attention back to the tomes on the table, she couldn't shake off the feeling that she was being watched. Hours passed, as Ashlyn delved into the texts, trying to piece together the puzzle of curses and demons that seemed to haunt the Miller family. The more she read, the more she realized just how deep the roots of darkness ran in their history. Just as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the room, Ashlyn heard a faint sound coming from down the hall. It was a soft chanting, barely audible but unmistakably eerie. Her heart raced as she considered whether Magda was up to something sinister. Gathering her courage, Ashlyn investigated. She closed the book she was reading, careful to keep the heavy cover from thumping closed. Easing out into the hallway, she took quiet steps through the long hall. As Ashlyn crept down the dimly lit hallway she heard chanting that grew louder, sending shivers down her spine. The sound seemed to come from a room at the end of the corridor, where a thin sliver of light seeped out from under the door. Heart pounding in her chest, she approached the door with trepidation, each step echoing in the house's stillness. Pressing her ear against the door, Ashlyn strained to make out the words being chanted. It was a language she didn't recognize, filled with guttural tones and ominous cadence. Fear gnawed at her insides, but she steeled herself and slowly turned the doorknob, praying it wouldn't creak and give her away. The door opened soundlessly into a room bathed in flickering candlelight, and heavy with the scent of incense. In the center of the room stood Magda, her eyes closed in deep concentration as she raised her arms in the air. Ashlyn wasn't sure what Magda was doing, but the chanting made her uneasy. She quietly closed the door and headed for the door. 8. Sierra panted heavily, watching from behind a grove of trees, hoping they couldn't sense her presence. The inky and forbidding night sky set the perfect atmosphere for escape, or being caught. This might be her only chance to get away and if she failed well, all might be lost. You'll have to run, Sierra muttered to herself, wondering how she was going to move fast enough to get away. Her swollen belly protruded in front of her. She was seven months pregnant. If she didn't get away now, there would be no hope for her or her child. They were in an unincorporated area that stretched to the edge of the Grand Mere State Park on Michigan's coast. All Hallows' Eve was fast approaching, and the family had packed up and traveled to the area to hold a ceremony for her son. She tried to run while they were in the city, hoping she could hide out in an abandoned house somewhere in a desolate neighborhood. 
but her mother had prevented her from leaving. Don't think about it, her mother sneered. This is fate. You can run if you want, but we will find you. I promise. Sierra pushed the words out of her head. Just because Brianna Miller has accepted her fate, doesn't mean I have, she muttered, recognizing her mother's complete absorption and commitment to maintaining the family mayhem that had colored their existence since the mid-1800s. But Sierra was determined to break free of the pact a long-dead relative had made. She hadn't signed on to be anyone's slave. Her life was her own. She would run as fast as she could into the woods. It was October in Michigan, and many of the trees had already shed their leaves. That was why she'd waited until night to take off. Even though the forest was naked, it would be difficult to spot her in the darkness. She just hoped that when she made it to the other side of the park, if she made it, someone was there. That night the ritual had taken place on the sand dunes on Lake Michigan's. Her family had gathered to perform a sacrifice, but the only person expected to give anything up was her and her unborn son. Sierra had ridden in the car with her mother, silent as they traveled to the campground where the family spent time at the end of each October. She hadn't been told what was coming, but she knew it had to do with her. You must sacrifice for the family, her mother told her. You've benefited from being a miller. You owe something for that. Those words indicated that something terrible was coming. Sierra had sought assistance before they left for the trip. She had asked for help from a source that she had been warned not to contact. Now she wondered if her grandfather was right. The darkness answers. The light asks. Her grandfather had told her. The statement represented the premise upon which the Miller family was built. The clandestine rituals during the spring and winter solstices, the recipes for potions to poison adversaries, and the obligatory gift to whatever demon they were in debt to, were all things Sierra had grown up thinking were normal parts of life. Now that she was expecting her first child, and had mingled with people who didn't worship dark entities, she wanted a different life for her child. That was why she went to the one place she thought could protect her from her family, the Catholic Church. She begged the priest for help, lying about her age, in hopes he'd recognize the urgency of the situation. Sierra knew she didn't look 16, but she was desperate. Um. Father, I need help. They're going to take my baby. I'm a teenage mom with nowhere to go. Please help. He'd promised to do all he could to save her child. A woman will come to see you. She will need all the information you have on who is trying to take your child and why. After that she will report back and we'll go from there. So. Are you going to help me? The priest, who looked too young to be in a position of authority, shook his angular face. If we can help, we will. A dart pierced the tree in front of her, pulling her back to the present. They were getting closer. She could feel her grandfather's dark mind roving through the woods. You won't get far. Give up now, he whispered in her head. Sierra carefully navigated the forest weaving through the trees and hoping that she'd come across something that would stop the pursuit. She was confident they wouldn't kill her, but they wouldn't hesitate to maim her if it wouldn't hurt the child. The baby, a son she intended to name Jonas, was healthy. He was exactly what they needed to keep their dark dynasty alive. He'll rule in this world, Brianna told her. And suffer in the next. No. I won't give you my baby. Brianna Miller had let out a loud cackle, throwing her head back in glee. You think you have a choice? You never had a choice. Your grandfather promised this child to its master before you were born. The boy you carry will be given to the one who owns him. No one owns my child. Sierra had screamed at her mother but now, as she stumbled through the woods, she realized it was true. Her son had been promised to someone or something else. Now she was fighting against the inevitable as hard as she could. In times like this she assumed that those bathed in the light prayed. Sadly she didn't know any prayers. How did one even go about praying? Sierra wasn't sure, and this wasn't the time to ponder spirituality. Instead she rushed as fast as she could toward Stevensville, a town on the other side of Lake Michigan. There was a rumor that her Aunt Agatha, the only person known to have successfully escaped their family, lived a quiet life there. She hoped her aunt would take her in and guard her from the rest of the clan. What power was her aunt using to keep the family at bay? 
How did she get permission to separate and live her life? You will not outrun us. It was her cousin, Sebastian. His voice was laced with contempt. He was the leader of the young contingent of the Millers. When their grandfather moved on to the netherworld, Sebastian would be the leader of the clan. Sierra knew he would do anything to gain more favor from his grandfather. It was painful to know that her cousin, who had been her best friend when she was younger, was not hunting her life prey. She'd watched him go from a bright-eyed, sweet boy with dreams of becoming a doctor to a vindictive warlock. Within a few months of Sebastian learning what their grandfather had in store for him, he became one of the most vicious members of the Miller clan. She knew being caught by him would lead to unspeakable pain. A large thicket of naked oak trees emerged in the distance. The naked branches of the trees reaching towards the sky. Brianna scanned the area, desperately looking for a place to take cover. Spotting a small depression behind the trees, she stumbled, grabbing hold of the trunk of a tree. A sharp pain spread through the back of her hand. Brianna yelped and pulled her hand to her chest and cradled it. She fell to the ground. Sebastian had shot her. Brianna wrapped her unwounded arm around her swollen belly. She'd lost the battle. The heat of her family closed in above her. She closed her eyes tightly and begged for mercy. God, if you are there, please save me and my baby. 9. Ashlyn pressed the accelerator and sped up towards the two-lane country road outside of the Miller mansion. She stared straight ahead, her mind racing from the information she'd gathered. The tome she'd skimmed was full of information about exchanges between the Millers and Baphomet. As she drove, Ashlyn couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled in her stomach since her encounter with Magda. The chanting and incense, she knew she needed to get as far away from the Miller mansion as possible, but a small voice in the back of her mind urged her to confront Magda and demand answers. There was more to the story. After what felt like hours of driving through the twisting roads of Louisiana, Ashlyn's phone buzzed with a text message. She glanced down and saw it was from Father Sixtus, her mentor in the world of supernatural investigations. The message simply read, Trust your instincts. Taking a deep breath, Ashlyn made a split-second decision and turned the car around, heading back towards the Miller mansion. As she approached the grand estate, a sense of foreboding washed over her. She parked and headed for the house, bursting through the door. You were trying to cast a spell on me, weren't you? Ashlyn demanded. Magda was standing in the doorway of the living room. Her kinky gray strands of hair fell around her shoulders like thin ropes. Magda's eyes widened in surprise at Ashlyn's sudden return and demanding tone. For a moment she seemed taken aback, but then a sly smile crept onto her face. Well, 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 the curious little bird has come back to roost, Magda said in a voice that sent a chill down Ashlyn's spine. You want to know more, do you? About the Millers and their dark pact with Baphomet? Ashlyn squared her shoulders, steeling herself against the aura of malevolence that seemed to emanate from Magda. I want the truth, she stated firmly. Tell me everything you know. Why did Agatha reject the demon's offer? What happened to her? Magda's smile grew wider, almost predatory, as she motioned for Ashlyn to sit down in one of the ornate armchairs that lined the room. Ashlyn hesitated for a moment before taking a deep breath and slowly dropping into the chair. I was trying to help. Even though I am estranged from the family, I still hold a place as the matriarch. I have powers. Do you want the information or not? I want to save Sierra and her baby. You know that. If your goals are the same, tell me what I need to know. Fair enough. Magda's gaze bore into Ashlyn, searching for any sign of deception. After a moment of tense silence, she let out a heavy sigh and spoke. Agatha was the outlier in the Miller family, the one who refused to bow to Baphomet's temptations, Magda started, her voice low and grave. She saw the darkness for what it was and walked away from it, sealing herself off from the rest of us. But Baphomet does not take rejection lightly. As Magda recounted the tale of Agatha's defiance and the tragic consequences that had befallen her, Ashlyn felt a chill creep up her spine. The ancient power of Baphomet was not something to be trifled with, and she knew they were treading on dangerous ground by delving into the Miller family's dark past. But Agatha turned to Christianity, and she really believes everything that faith teaches. She used it as a shield to fend off her parents and siblings. Magda continued, 
her eyes suddenly hardening with resolve. Agatha is Brianna and Marcus's much older half-sister. She lived part of her life with her father, so the curse was not something she was used to. When she turned eight, her father passed away and she went to live with the Millers for the first time. What happened to her father? Magda nodded her head. Your suspicions are duly noted. Yes, her father died a mysterious death. The tire of his motorcycle came loose and sent him flying down an embankment. He was involved in a custody battle with Brianna at the time. Now that almost all the family members have embraced the curse, Baphomet's influence is growing stronger, seeking to claim another soul from the Miller bloodline. Ashlyn leaned forward, her heart pounding with a mixture of fear and determination. What can we do to stop it? she asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Magda's eyes bore into Ashlyn with a mix of ancient wisdom and steely resolve. There is a way to break the curse that plagues the Miller family, but it will require great sacrifice and unwavering courage, she intoned. Are you prepared to face the darkness head-on and fight for Sierra's soul? Without hesitation, Ashlyn nodded, her jaw set in determination. She knew that the path ahead would be fraught with peril, but she also knew that she couldn't turn away now. Not when Sierra's life hung in the balance. I am. How are you going to do it? Ashlyn knew Magda was plotting something. She wasn't sure what, but she had all the information she needed. I have to go, she said, standing up and heading for the door. You ever wonder why your life is so lonely? Magda asked. Ashlyn stopped. She blinked away the sting of the woman's words. Oh. She can't even look at me, Magda said. She seemed to be speaking to someone else. Ashlyn was careful not to turn around. This was a weak spot, a way to get into her head. Marcus is a miller, and he resented what you did. Don't you ever wonder why you've never found another man? After the relationship with Marcus ended, Ashlyn had gone through a string of trivial connections, but she hadn't had another long-term relationship. Ashlyn forced herself to keep walking, ignoring the taunting words echoing in her ears. She couldn't afford to let Magda's insidious insinuations get to her now, not when Sierra's life was on the line. With each step she took towards the door, determination burned like a fierce flame in her chest. She would break the curse that plagued the Miller family, no matter the cost. As she stepped out into the cool night air, Ashlyn knew that time was running short. The darkness looming over the Miller mansion seemed to pulse with an ominous energy, a reminder of the malevolent force they were up against. She needed a plan, a way to confront Baphomet and free Sierra from its clutches. Her phone buzzed as she climbed into the car. It was Father Sixtus again. Ashlyn, get out of there. She stared at her phone for a moment. How could he know she was still at Magda's? Ashlyn punched in his number and activated the speakerphone before tossing the device on the passenger seat, starting up the car and taking off. He picked up after the second ring. Father Sixtus' voice crackled through the car speakers, filled with urgency and concern. Ashlyn, I made a mistake. You shouldn't be there. Please get out of the state as soon as possible. Ashlyn's grip on the steering wheel tightened as she navigated the winding roads away from the estate. She could feel the weight of Father Sixtus' words pressing down on her, a stark reminder of the perilous situation she had thrust herself into. What's happened? I, you need to get back here. Please leave now. She knew things about me, Father, Ashlyn replied, her voice tinged with sadness. I'm so sorry to put you in this position. Forgive me, Ashlyn. Please come home. I'm on my way, but I have to go to the west side of the state once I get back. Sierra and her baby are in danger, but there is a miller who broke away from the curse. There was a brief pause before Father Sixtus spoke again, his tone softer but no less firm. I understand your desire to help, Ashlyn. But you must remember the limits of your own power. Something terrible has happened. Tell me. Ashlyn said. Just promise me you won't act until we meet. I promise. None of the Millers are around. We fear they are with Sierra. The ritual may have already begun. I don't care. This isn't happening. I'm going after her no matter what. Ashlyn caught the red eye back to Detroit that night, leaving behind the mysterious interaction she'd had with Magda in Louisiana. 
The plane ride back was turbulent, matching the storm brewing inside her. Ashlyn couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled deep in her bones since meeting Magda. The memory of the woman's hollow gaze and chilling words haunted her, replaying like a sinister melody in her mind. As the plane descended into Detroit, the city's dark silhouette welcomed her back with open arms. The familiar sights did little to calm her racing heart as she hailed a cab to take her home. Despite the late hour, there was a light flickering in the guest bedroom of Ashland's house. She watched the room go dark and light in intervals. Was Raymond in the house? If so, why would he leave a flickering light on? She quietly opened the door and eased inside. Bruno and Rex greeted her, but without their usual barking. Ashlyn rubbed their heads while she scanned the living room and kitchen. Nothing looked as if it was out of place. She glanced down the hallway and saw that the guest bedroom door was cracked. The light was still faltering on and off. Ashlyn looked at the dogs. Both had wide eyes. She wondered what they'd seen. Raymond, she called down the hallway. Her voice slightly echoing through the hallway. When no response came, she inched away from the dogs. Bruno let out a whine. It's okay, boy. Nothing's wrong, Ashlyn told the dog, hoping she was right. Her hands shook as she walked down the hallway. Each footfall bringing her closer to the eerie light that crept out of the cracked door. Inside the air felt heavy and oppressive, pushing down on her with its silence. A message was hastily scrawled on the far wall of the bedroom, using a substance that oozed down towards the floor. Promises made, promises kept. Ashlyn froze. Magda's words. She'd said that about Marcus and the curse she claimed he'd put on Ashlyn. She walked over to the wall and touched the liquid that slid down the wall. Red and thick. Was it blood? Ashlyn pulled her hand away and rushed out of the room, slamming the door. She headed to the bathroom and washed her hands. After that, she went to her bedroom and grabbed a suitcase and began packing clothes. It was five in the morning, but as soon as the sun rose, she'd get the dogs in the car and drive to Father Sixtus's office. She was going to head to West Michigan after that. After packing the suitcase, she headed towards the living room, stopping short by the guest bedroom. The light was no longer flickering. Ashlyn pushed the door open and looked inside. The words written in blood were gone. She stood in the doorway, her heart beating in her ears. Had the message really been there? Had she imagined it? Ashlyn's hands trembled as she stared at the blank wall. The remnants of the chilling message now vanished. Doubt gnawed at her mind, questioning her sanity and perception. She couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, as if unseen eyes lingered in the shadows following her every move. A sudden chill ran down her spine, causing Ashlyn to turn around swiftly. The room felt colder now, a stark contrast to the oppressive heat from moments ago. The dogs stood at the doorway, their fur bristling as they growled softly at something unseen. Bruno's low rumble sent shivers down Ashlyn's spine. Raymond? She called out again, her voice wavering slightly this time. Silence was her only answer, the air heavy with tension and foreboding. With hesitant steps, Ashlyn approached the bed, her eyes scanning every corner for any sign of intrusion. A faint whisper brushed against her ear, so soft she wasn't sure she'd heard anything. A promise made, a promise kept. Ashlyn backed out of the room, slamming the door shut and running to the living room. Come on, boys. She yelled, throwing the front door open. Rex and Bruno followed her. The morning traffic was thin and easy to navigate, which was good because Ashlyn was having trouble concentrating. When she pulled up in front of Father Sixtus's office, realized that this was the worst time to bother him. School was starting in a few minutes. But it couldn't be helped. She had to talk to him immediately. Ashlyn hurried into Father Sixtus's office, the dogs following closely at her heels. She found him in his small, dimly lit office surrounded by stacks of books and papers. His expression was one of concern as he looked up at Ashlyn's anxious face. Father Sixtus something happened last night. I think Magda. I think she followed me back, Ashlyn blurted out, the words tumbling over each other in her haste to explain. Father Sixtus rose from his chair, his brow furrowed in worry. Magda? Are you sure it was her? Ashlyn nodded, her hands trembling as she recounted the strange occurrences from the previous night. The flickering light, the chilling message on the wall, the whispers in the dark. Father Sixtus listened intently, his expression growing graver with each detail she shared. 
We have to act fast. I doubt Magda followed you but she may have sent something with you. Have you been to adoration? I've been busy. Saying your rosary? Ashlyn bit her bottom lip. Father Sixtus, I'm trying to save a young woman who is going to lose her baby to a demon. Life has been a little busy. Yes. I'm sure it has, but you can't help someone if you are not taking care of yourself. I still pray. You're going to need to do more than just pray. Your faith life must be strong for this to work. You're in danger if you don't maintain a robust prayer life. Father Sixtus looked behind her and focused on the dogs. You have dogs in my office. Yeah about that. I need a favor. Father Sixtus held up his hands. No. I am not an animal person. Pretend to be St. Francis of Assisi for a few days. He shook his head. Isn't there anyone else you can ask? Not on such short notice. Father Sixtus crossed his arms over his chest. Fine. The dogs can stay. What do I need to do for them? Walks in the mornings and evenings. Feed them when you get up and after school before the evening walk. Ashlyn pulled a wallet out and handed Father Sixtus some cash. Here's for their food and thank you for doing this. I'll be back in a few days to pick them up, she said gratefully. Father Sixtus sighed, taking the money reluctantly. I'll take care of them but you owe me big time for this Ashlyn. She nodded, relief flooding her at knowing the dogs would be safe with Father Sixtus. As she turned to leave, Father Sixtus called out to her. Ashlyn, trust in your faith and stay vigilant. Ashlyn nodded solemnly, the weight of his words settling on her shoulders as she stepped out of the office. The sun was high in the sky now, casting long shadows on the pavement as she made pocket and pulled out a wad of $20 bills. I didn't have time to grab their food. They prefer wet but dry is fine too. Any particular brand? It'll only be a few days. Get something respectable. So no dollar store food? Ashlyn squinted her eyes at Father Sixtus. Just checking. I find myself there a lot picking up things for the school. Thought maybe I could condense the trips. 10. The old growth forest remained serene, its towering trees reaching towards the heavens. Ashlyn treaded carefully along the trail, attempting to dampen the sound of her footsteps. However, with each step, the crisp leaves crunched under her feet, echoing through the vast peaceful wilderness. Agatha had drawn a map to the cabin. It was a few miles from Lake Michigan's shore, up a gradual incline. As Ashlyn followed Agatha's map deeper into the forest, the shadows grew longer, swallowing the path ahead. The afternoon sun was filtering through the dense canopy above, but as she neared the cabin, the sun disappeared and the air seemed to thicken. She quickened her pace, her heart pounding in her chest like a drumbeat of warning. The surrounding trees seemed to whisper secrets, their ancient voices carrying a sense of foreboding. Images of dark rituals and eerie chants flickered in her mind, fueled by the sinister atmosphere surrounding her. Finally, after what felt like an eternity of winding through the towering trees, Ashlyn saw a faint flicker of light up ahead. The cabin emerged from the shadows, its weathered walls standing in stark contrast to the vibrant green of the forest. It loomed ominously, a silent sentinel guarding its secrets. She was a few yards away when the door flew open. A tall man with raven black eyes floated out of the doorway. No time for parlor trick, Ashlyn said, remaining still and calm. She didn't want him to think his dark magic impressed her. I can feel your pulse. It's picked up quite a bit, but if you want to pretend like nothing has happened, so be it. It's Sebastian, by the way. And your name? Ashlyn kept her gaze steady on the man with raven black eyes, a faint glimmer of defiance in her own. I'm here to take Sierra home, she stated firmly, her voice unwavering despite the ominous presence emanating from the cabin. She could sense the dark energy swirling around him, but she refused to let it intimidate her. Sebastian's lips curled into a sardonic smile, revealing a glint of sharp teeth. Help? You think you can help them? You're just a mere mortal playing at being a savior, he sneered, his voice dripping with contempt. Ashlyn felt a surge of anger rising within her at his taunts, but she forced herself to remain composed. I will succeed, she retorted, her words laced with an unwavering resolve. The opposite of what she felt inside. A gust of wind pushed against her. 
Ashlyn closed her eyes and focused. She prayed in her head, asking for help against this unnatural force. Opening her eyes, Ashlyn fell to the ground but immediately stood up, holding her ground. Sebastian's raven black eyes recoiled slightly, his sinister smile faltering for a moment. She could sense his surprise at her display of strength, a glimmer of uncertainty flickering in his dark gaze. You may have your tricks, but I've got something better, Ashlyn declared, her voice ringing with authority and conviction. The man's expression darkened, his features contorting with rage as he realized he was facing a foe unlike any other. With a guttural growl, he raised a hand towards Ashlyn, unleashing a dark cloud of energy in her direction. But she stood her ground, her faith shielding her from the malevolent onslaught. As the tendrils of darkness ebbed away harmlessly in front of her, something tugged at the back of the heel of her foot. When Ashlyn looked down, vines were winding around her ankles. She watched the vines climb up her leg, her mind frozen with fear. I didn't want to have to do this. Ashlyn looked up and saw Agatha. Ashlyn looked up and saw Agatha, who wore a long black cloak. Agatha? I can't let you do this by yourself. Oh, I'm delighted you're here, the man said. We thought you might join the fun, dear cousin. You won't be delighted when I'm done, Agatha said, stepping closer and reaching for the vines around Ashlyn's ankles. Lord, please guide us against the evil, she began, before looking up at Ashlyn. Come on now. Say your rosary or whatever you people pray. Come on. You can do this. Ashlyn felt her mind ease as she realized what was happening. Agatha had come to battle with her. Pater Noster, Chies in Celis, Sanctifistor Nomen Tum, Adveniat Regnum Tum, Fiat Voluntas Tua, Sicut in Silo et in Terra. Panem Nostrum Cotidianum da Nobis Hodi, et Demit Nobis Debita Nostra. Sicut et nos demitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducus in tentationem sed libera nos amalo. The woods fell silent when Ashlyn finished praying the Lord's Prayer. She stepped out of the rest of the vines Agatha hadn't been able to dislodge from her feet and said, Let's get in there. The two women looped arms and walked towards the cabin, both praying in their respective traditions. The man roared in the background, but Ashlyn could tell that his powers were waning. When they reached the door, a terrible sight greeted their eyes. They found Sierra strapped to a gurney, with her arms out at her sides. Ashlyn and Agatha rushed inside. Sierra's head was drooping to one side. Sierra, can you hear me? Ashlyn asked. She can't hear you. He's put a spell on her. There's no way we're getting her out of here. We don't have a choice. We need to get her out of here. Agatha nodded grimly her eyes scanning the room for any signs of a way to release Sierra from the gurney. The air in the cabin felt heavy with malevolence, each breath they took seeming to fill their lungs with darkness. Ashlyn cautiously approached Sierra, reaching out a hand to shake her gently, attempting to rouse her from the spell that bound her. As Ashlyn's fingers brushed against Sierra's arm, a shiver ran down her spine. The moment seemed to stretch endlessly, before Sierra's eyes slowly fluttered open. They were clouded with confusion and fear, but with a flicker of recognition as she gazed at Ashlyn. It's me, Sierra. You're safe now, Ashlyn whispered urgently, her voice a reassuring anchor in the sea of chaos surrounding them. Sierra's lips parted as if attempting to speak, but no sound emerged. We need to hurry, Agatha urged, her voice tinged with urgency. He'll be in here soon. Not if we stop him. How? I've got endless prayers. How about you? Agatha was quiet for a moment. I don't have a lot of set prayers in my mind, but I can pray for a long time. Then do that. Don't stop. Just pray and don't let his antics get to you. Agatha and Ashlyn grasped hands and closed their eyes. Together, their voices rose in a cacophony of fervent prayers, a barrier of divine protection forming around them. The cabin seemed to tremble at the onslaught of their combined faith the dark energy recoiling at the purity of their intentions. As they prayed, a blinding light erupted within the cabin, casting away the shadows that had clung to every corner. Sebastian let out a guttural scream, his form flickering as if unable to withstand the power radiating from Ashlyn and Agatha. Sierra's eyes cleared further, a spark of strength returning to her gaze as she reached out for Ashlyn's hand. With a last surge of energy, Sebastian let out one last desperate howl before dissipating into nothingness, leaving behind only a cold echo in the air. 
The ropes binding Sierra fell away, and she embraced Ashlyn and Agatha tightly, gratitude shining in her eyes. We did it, Agatha whispered. Help me unstrap Sierra. She's not going to wake up. I don't care. We're not leaving her here. After they unstrapped Sierra from the gurney, she collapsed into her arms. We can't? We must, Ashlyn said, cutting Agatha off before she could finish stating that they couldn't do something. She's too heavy. Take her left arm. I'll take the right, Ashlyn said. Together with great effort, Ashlyn and Agatha managed to lift Sierra in their arms. Her body felt unnaturally heavy, as if a force was trying to hold her back. Ignoring the strain on their bodies, they carried her towards the doorway, the protective barrier of their prayers still lingering around them like a shield. As they stepped out of the cabin, the air felt lighter, purer. The surrounding woods seemed to exhale a sigh of relief, as if they too had been released from the grip of darkness that once held them captive. The trio made their way through the trees, guided by a faint glimmer of dawn on the horizon. With each step Sierra grew lighter in their arms, her breathing becoming steadier and more peaceful. It was as though the evil that had enveloped her was slowly dissipating, leaving behind a sense of calm and serenity. Finally, they emerged from the woods into the first light of morning. 11. Agatha and Ashlyn got Sierra into Ashlyn's car and strapped her into the passenger seat. It's best you take her as far away from here as possible, Agatha said. I will. And before you go, thank you for nudging me to help. Thank you for coming to assist. I don't know that I would have made it if you hadn't showed up. You would have figured something else out. I admire your faith and bravery. The Millers are dangerous people. Ashlyn nodded. But God is more powerful. On that note the two parted, and Ashlyn began the drive back to Detroit. Sierra didn't wake while they were driving. She wasn't sure what type of spell the Millers had cast on her, but Ashlyn was determined to break it. As the city lights of Detroit came into view, a sense of foreboding settled in Ashlyn's chest. She glanced at Sierra still unconscious beside her, and felt a surge of determination. The Millers may have cast their dark magic but she had something they could never understand, faith. Parking the car in a dimly lit alleyway, Ashlyn whispered a prayer under her breath before gently shaking Sierra awake. The young woman's eyes fluttered open, confusion clouding her features. Sierra, can you hear me? Ashlyn's voice was urgent yet soothing. No response. How she was going to get her into the back door of her house was a mystery. If Sierra couldn't walk, Ashlyn knew she would have to carry her. With a deep breath, she unbuckled Sierra and carefully lifted her petite frame into her arms. The weight was unexpected, but Ashlyn's resolve only strengthened. She pushed open the car door and stepped out into the chilly night air. The alley seemed darker than usual, the shadows dancing in an unsettling way that made Ashlyn's skin prickle with unease. Ignoring the creeping sense of dread, she carried Sierra towards her house, each step heavier than the last. As they approached the back door, a sudden gust of wind rattled the nearby trash cans, causing Sierra to stir slightly in Ashlyn's arms. The momentary panic subsided when she realized Sierra hadn't fully woken up. Gently setting Sierra down on a nearby chair, Ashlyn surveyed the dimly lit kitchen. The faint flickering of the candle on the table cast eerie shadows on the walls, creating a haunting atmosphere. Ray? Are you here? Ashlyn called as she moved Sierra into the living room and gently sat her down. She noticed that the guest bedroom door was open. After checking to see if Sierra was waking, she headed down the hallway. Ray? You in here? She stepped into the room and saw Marcus standing there. His eyes glowed with an otherworldly light, a twisted smile playing on his lips. Ashlyn's heart pounded in her chest as she instinctively took a step back, her hand reaching for the crucifix hidden beneath her shirt. Ah, Ashlyn, Marcus purred, his voice dripping with malice. I was wondering when you would show up. Did you really think you could outsmart us? How did you get out of prison? Marcus titled his head back and let out a raucous laugh that shook the house. You think prison can stop me? Now give me the girl and I will leave. Ashlyn stood her ground, her fingers tightly gripping the crucifix as she stared at Marcus with unwavering determination. 
She could feel the weight of his dark presence suffocating the surrounding air, but she refused to let fear overtake her. I will never let you have her, Ashlyn's voice was steady, belying the fear churning in her gut. Marcus took a step closer, his gaze piercing through her defenses. You don't understand, Ashlyn. The power we possess is beyond your comprehension. Hand over the girl or face the consequences. Ashlyn's mind raced, trying to find a way out of the impossible situation. She knew she couldn't let Sierra fall back into the clutches of the Millers, but facing Marcus alone was a terrifying prospect. You'll have to kill me if you want to take her. Marcus laughed again. Bonus. He bellowed before reaching out for Ashlyn. She dropped to her knees and scrambled to the door, but it shut before she could make it to the hallway. What's wrong? Marcus's voice had changed. Ashlyn turned around and gasped. Marcus was nowhere to be seen. Her brother was standing in his place. Ash, it's me. Why are you running away from me? Ray took a step towards her, confusion etched across his face. Ashlyn couldn't believe what she was seeing. She reached underneath her shirt and lifted her crucifix. Stay back, Ray. It's not you, I swear. Ray's eyes widened as he backed away, his face draining of color. Ashlyn could feel the power coursing through her, the holy symbol pulsing with intensity. She took a deep breath, ready to call upon the divine for help. Please, Ash. What's going on? Before she could respond, Raymond turned to Marcus. His eyes were no longer glowing, and his smile was gone, replaced by a twisted sneer. You think you can defeat me? He sneered, closing the distance between them. Ashlyn shivered, too disturbed to respond. The child is ours. Marcus morphed into Baphomet. She watched the horns and hoofs sprout from its hands and head. Out of my way. The creature roared. Ashlyn held her ground. She ran her fingers over her crucifix as she prayed the rosary. Baphomet covered its ears with its long steely paws and yowled. Ashlyn continued to pray, feeling her strength increase with each word. Ave Maria Gratia Plena, Dominus Tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Isis. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Ashlyn repeated the refrain repeatedly, her voice increasing in volume with each rendition. As she neared the end of the decade of the rosary, Baphomet shrank and when she spoke the last word it disappeared. Raymond, crumbled and unconscious, appeared in its spot. She rushed over to him. Ray? Ray? Can you hear me? He didn't respond, but she could hear his soft breathing. She rubbed his forehead, said a quick prayer and went to call Father Sixtus. In a flash, Ashlyn dialed Father Sixtus' number on her phone, her fingers trembling with the aftermath of the intense confrontation. As the phone rang she cast a worried glance towards Raymond's unconscious form, willing him to be safe. Father Sixtus, Ashlyn's voice was urgent as he picked up. It's Ashlyn. I've encountered Baphomet. There was a brief pause on the line before Father Sixtus responded, his tone grave. Stay calm, Ashlyn. I will be there as soon as possible. Protect Raymond at all costs. With those words echoing in her ears, Ashlyn hung up the phone and turned her attention back to Raymond. She knelt beside him whispering prayers of protection and healing as she waited for Father Sixtus to arrive. Minutes felt like hours as she kept a vigilant watch over Raymond, her senses heightened and alert for any sign of danger. When she was sure Raymond was stable, she went to check on Sierra who was still unconscious on the couch. The young woman looked peaceful. Ashlyn just wished she'd wake up. 12. Father Sixtus arrived with Rex and Bruno 20 minutes later. He rushed into the house and grabbed Ashlyn by the shoulders. Are you okay? What happened? She recounted the events of the evening and asked Father Sixtus what they should do. We'll get Raymond into bed. As for Sierra, I think we need to take her to the hospital. Something supernatural has put her in a deep sleep. Maybe. I don't know if that's the case. What if she has something in her system? I don't think it will go over well if we show up at the hospital with an unconscious pregnant woman. Not at most hospitals, but I know somewhere we can take her. Where? We have to act quickly, Father Sixtus said, his voice low and urgent. We can't risk losing her or the baby. 
With swift precision, they carefully lifted Sierra and carried her out of the house, mindful of her delicate condition. Father Sixtus led them to his car parked outside, a black sedan that seemed almost ominous in the dimly lit street. Where are we taking her? Ashlyn asked as she settled Sierra in the back seat, adjusting her head gently on a small pillow. There's a secluded clinic not far from here, Father Sixtus replied cryptically, his eyes reflecting a mixture of determination and fear. A friend, Sister Eleanor, runs the clinic. She'll take good care of her and keep things quiet. The clinic was only a few blocks away from Ashland's house. A large brick building that she thought was abandoned had a backdoor entrance. People were filtering in and out of the area. Stay here, Father Sixtus said, getting out of the car. He returned ten minutes later with the two men and a gurney. They'll take good care of her, he said, nodding at the men. I've never heard of this clinic. That's by design. One of the orderlies said. We keep a low profile and Sis keeps everyone healthy. As Father Sixtus and the orderly carefully lifted Sierra onto the gurney, Ashlyn felt a wave of unease wash over her. The dimly lit alley and the secretive nature of the clinic sent chills down her spine. She followed them inside, her footsteps echoing in the empty hallway. Sister Eleanor appeared from a doorway, her gentle smile contrasting with the sterile surroundings. Thank you for bringing her here, Father, she said, her voice soft yet filled with authority. Father Sixtus nodded gravely. Please take care of her. She's in a delicate state. The orderly wheeled Sierra down a corridor, disappearing behind a set of double doors. Ashlyn felt a pang of anxiety at the thought of leaving Sierra in this unknown place, but she knew they had no other choice. Father Sixtus turned to Ashlyn, his expression serious. We must trust Sister Eleanor. She has helped many in need. I also briefed her on the situation. She's confident that Sierra will be awake soon. Ashlyn felt strange leaving Sierra by at the clandestine clinic, but she had little a choice. Even if some type of spell had been cast on Sierra, she didn't know what to do to help her. It was best to leave it in Sister Eleanor's hands. Bruno and Rex slept at the bottom of Ashlyn's bed that night. The next morning Raymond was groggy but awake and asking questions. She wasn't sure how to explain what happened, but Ashlyn knew it was time to confront him, even if he was recovering. Raymond, I want to help you but there is something you must do. What is that? Leave the occult alone. He frowned and rolled his eyes. Ash, I... No. This isn't a request. If you don't agree to this, I will have to take drastic measures. What does that mean, he scoffed. Ashlyn's eyes darkened as she met Raymond's defiant gaze. She could sense the lingering presence of something sinister, something that had ensnared him in its grip. Her voice was firm and unwavering as she spoke. There are forces at play here that you cannot comprehend, Raymond. The occult is not a game, it's dangerous. It's already cost us so much. Raymond's expression shifted from defiance to uncertainty, a flicker of fear crossing his features. I don't understand. I just wanted to, to find answers, he stammered, his bravado crumbling under Ashlyn's intense gaze. The answers you seek are not found in darkness, Ashlyn said, her voice tinged with sorrow. You have a choice to make, Raymond. Renounce the occult and embrace the light or face the consequences. Raymond looked down, his hands trembling. What does embracing the light mean? Ashlyn nodded gently. Let's start slow. First, stop all occult activity. Then we'll work on getting you a job. After that I would love for you to come to church with me, but I want that to be your choice. Raymond's gaze flickered with a mix of emotions as he processed Ashlyn's words. The weight of her ultimatum hung heavy in the air, the gravity of his decisions pressing down on him like a suffocating shroud. He knew deep down that his actions had led them to this dark, uncertain place, but the path to redemption seemed daunting and unfamiliar. I. I'll do it, he finally whispered, his voice barely above a breath. I'll renounce the occult. I'll do whatever it takes to make things right. Ashlyn saw a glimmer of hope in his eyes, a spark of determination amidst the shadows that had clouded his soul. She reached out and placed a reassuring hand on his shoulder, a silent promise of support and guidance in the turbulent journey ahead. Thank you, Raymond, she said, her voice filled with gratitude. Together, we can overcome this darkness. 
The next day, Father Sixtus called and told Ashlyn that Sierra was awake. Really? Yes. She'd been given a large dose of valerian root and starved. The baby fed off her nutrient reserves and the valerian root knocked her out. The Millers used a drug and cruel starvation to get her into that unconscious state. Ashlyn's heart sank at the heinous cruelty behind Sierra's condition. She felt a wave of anger and determination wash over her. Gathering her resolve, she asked Father Sixtus, What can we do now? How can we help her? Father Sixtus's voice was grim as he replied, We need to perform a special deliverance prayer on Sierra to rid her of any lingering evil influence from that ordeal. But be warned, this will not be easy. The Millers have invited darkness into their lives, and it will not let go without a fight. Okay. When? I can be at your place in twenty minutes. Father Sixtus showed up with a book of deliverance prayers. We'll pray prayers from this book. It's designed for this situation. I have another copy in the car that I intend to leave with Sierra. She wasn't open to prayers when I met with her. Things change. They do, but Sierra was pretty sure she didn't want anything to do with faith. He smiled. Sister Eleanor is teaching Sierra how to pray the rosary. She told me they've made it through a decade, and Sierra has a lot of questions that led Sister to believe that she will be giving Mass a try when she gets out of the hospital. Really? It's only been. I know but Sister Eleanor is special. She can be very convincing. 